It is five o'clock, and we will go ahead and open up our work session of our Douglas High School District Board of Education on November 10th. I'm acknowledging that all directors are either remote or present today. Typically, in work sessions, we do have various topics that we discuss informally with staff. Um, but tonight, board, we do have issues that we need to discuss in executive session. Um, to consider the purchase, acquisition, lease, transfer, or sale of real property pursuant to CRS 246402-4A, um, and also to hold conference with our district's attorney to receive legal advice on specific legal questions pursuant to CRS 246402-4B. Uh, during executive session, the board is not allowed to adopt any proposed policy, resolution, regulation, or take any formal action. We do have everyone present today, and so a two-thirds affirmative vote is needed for us to move in executive session. Is there a motion to adjourn our regular meeting and move into executive session? So moved. Second. Motion made by Holtzman, seconded by Lung. Our executive session will include consultation with the following individuals. Um, Interim Superintendent Corey Wise, Chief Operating Officer Rich Cosgrove, General Counsel Mary Clay K. Clemish, Planning Manager Derek Sturtz. We will also have um, guests from the Commercial Real Estate Service, CBRE, um, specifically Carla Bateman, Eric Roth, and Martin Roth. Those individuals will be joining us in executive session. Motion to made and seconded. Any further discussion or questions? All right, seeing none, let's go ahead and vote. Chancho Shore. Aye. Graziano. Aye. Hansen. Holtzman. Aye. Lauren. Aye. Meek. Aye. Ray. Aye. That passes unanimously. We are now moving into executive session.
appreciate that, Kevin. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. Mr. Blair, are we good? Good. All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm calling to order the Douglas County School District Board of Education meeting for November 10th at 6:02. We will begin with roll call. Director Chancho Shore. Here. Graziano. Here. Hansen. Here. Holtzman. Here. Lung. Here. Meek. Here. Ray is here. We're all here and present. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First on our agenda is to do some student and staff recognitions, our favorite moment of the meeting. So interim superintendent Corey Wise, welcome and share the good news. All right, thank you. Good evening, everybody. And uh, it is my privilege to take a second and just like to acknowledge tomorrow's Veterans Day. When we think about Veterans Day, just wanna say thank you, show appreciation to all those who have served, who are currently serving, those in our community, and we have many students that have graduated that have served and continue to serve. So can we give a round of applause for everyone in, who's uh, serving for me? You know, every year we do some great celebrations. Uh, Shannon Shelton and Cimarron, uh, we have a number of schools that have always done uh, Veterans Day celebrations, and this year schools have got, had to get a little creative. We've had to look at ways to do videos, uh, we are having a drive-through uh, celebration that I'd love to have you see at Legacy Point, uh, so take a look at that. Pine Grove Elementary, if you drive by their school, they have photographs and, and displays to celebrate Veterans Day. And, uh, you know, when we think about those videos, I want to take a second. And uh, Redstone Elementary and their Student Lighthouse team has put together a really uh, great snapshot video to really honor our veterans. So let's take a second and enjoy it. Welcome everybody to our virtual Veterans Day Assembly. We are here to honor and celebrate all of the veterans who have served for our country. Now let's give a warm welcome to Scout Path 782, who will be bringing in the colors. Color Guard Forward March. Color Guard Halt. Color Guard, please post the colors. Thank you Cub Scout Pack 782 for bringing in the colors. We celebrate this day to honor the brave men and women who have fought for our country. Our freedom and independence is because of them. This is the day we celebrate because it marks the day in history where World War I ended and the treaty was signed. Please help us welcome a veteran that is here to speak with us today, Mr. Tim Eggins. We're on the base of Lowry Air Force Base that was housed here from 1938 to 1994 when it was retired. And on this base, we have the Wings Over the Rockies Air and Space Museum, of which I'm a proud volunteer. And over my shoulder here, you'll see as we enter the museum, we have a B-52. Now the B-52s belong to the United States Air Force, and they've been flying for over 60 years protecting our great nation. Also in front of the B-52s, you'll notice the various flags from the different branches of the service. We have the Army, the Marines, the Navy, the Air Force, the Coast Guard, and our newest branch this year, the United States Space Force. Mr. Eggett, we appreciate everything you have done to serve in our country. Liberty and justice, liberty and justice.
So, so a big round of applause for uh, Mountain Vista Cross Country. Uh, here with us tonight are members of the cross country team along with Principal Michael Weaver, Athletic Director Jim Flanagan, and cross country coaches Jonathan Dalby and Eric Selly. Uh, Mr. Weaver, if I can turn it over to you to introduce your coaches and your athletes and, uh, and really uh, say what an achievement, how proud you are of uh, these great student athletes. Thanks, uh, Corey. I appreciate that. Um, first of all, uh, Coach Selly and Coach Dalby have uh, worked closely with Coach Angela Lowell as well as the other coaches on the staff. Um, and they have done such an amazing job. When you talk about the term uh, dynasty in a program, um, in what's become a tradition at Mountain Vista, the dynasty is just not the trophies and the state championship banners and acknowledges, acknowledgements like these, but um, the type of program that Vista Nation has become. Hundreds of kids every year uh, learning how to compete, learning how to push themselves, learning how to be great teammates. And we could not be more proud, not only of the accomplishments in, in the competitive end of things, but what a... Uh, what a representative program for our school that uh, Vista Nation has become, and we're very, very proud of them. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, the 5A State Cross Country Coach of the Year, Jonathan Dalby, um, and I think he's going to introduce the kids. Uh, okay. Um, thanks for having us, and I uh, appreciate the, the recognition for the kids tonight. Uh, so with us tonight, I believe on the call, uh, Eric Selly, who uh, is uh, Eric and I are co-head coaches together for the last 14 years. Uh, and then the athletes, I'll start with our alternates uh, tonight, uh, Landon Hart and uh, Gavin White, who were just uh, sophomores. And then uh, junior Luke Urban were uh, alternates for us uh, this year and plan to see them hopefully next year. Uh, at the state meet up on the podium as well. Uh, and then our athletes that ran uh, in the meet, uh, junior Aaron Yoakum, uh, he was 35th at the state meet. Uh, junior Nate Harbert was uh, 30th at the state meet as a junior. Uh, Owen Nolan, also a junior, 28th. Uh, Kyle Bowe, uh, one of our two seniors, uh, 27th. Uh, and then our top 11 finishers, uh, Harrison Witt, 11th as a senior. Uh, and Jaden Nats, who made the uh, podium this year for us as a junior, was 10th. So I'm excited for these guys, really proud of them uh, for the hard work they've put in, especially under the circumstances uh, of COVID. And um, uh, just excited for them and uh, proud that they could uh, represent the community, the Mountain Vista community, well down at the state meet. Yeah, very nice. How about a round of applause? <clears throat> You know, speaking firsthand, uh, it's not just a high school piece. You guys do it as a feeder. Uh, I watch as you build it uh, from a young age in the running and how you build it with the middle school level and the high school. So uh, when Mike says a legacy and, uh, and traditions, uh, well done to all of you, not only uh, out there uh, with cross country, but in the classroom. So appreciate your leadership and dedication and hard work. Uh, I'd like to also transition and start thinking about um, those staff members then and just those amazing acts of kindness. You know, when we think about uh, this year with COVID-19, uh, there's uh, a, lot of, a lot of times where we need to just stop and say, look at all the, the great things that people do, who people are, and the difference uh, that you make. And uh, as we think about uh, over the time, Colorado's experienced a pretty tough fire season. On October 22nd, Stone Canyon Outdoor Ed Adventures took 53 fire evacuees from Estes Park due to the East Troublesome Fire. They took them in and, and the person who reached out to Stone Canyon was a former DCSD student. Um, on, on the line representing Stone Canyon is Jolie Jones, Todd Dupree, Alicia Gerber, Jamie Logston, and TJ Roberts. And Jolie, I wanna start with you just to say uh, how much we appreciate one, not only what you do for our district, our community and our students, but also to take the time to think about what we do for our, our first responders, the firefighters who are out there um, and really taking on uh, the work of, of helping Colorado in these troublesome times. So Jolie. Yeah, uh, thank you first of all for the recognition. Um, it, it, I know it means a lot to our team that we were able to, to be here tonight. Um, you know, I think, like you said, Corey, looking at this year, there's so much uh, tumultuous things that have been happening for us to be able to help our community uh, one of which was our one of our own uh, DCSD students formerly. 
we couldn't not do that. Uh, it was a unexpected day, the, the day that it actually happened on October 22nd. Uh, we were just having a regular good old programming day, having fun with some kids down there, watching that freezing rain roll in uh, kind of last minute uh, and put a kink in our day, but we found out that they were gonna be evacuating that afternoon. And we, the, the small team that we had there on site really came together, we made a plan. And as luck would have it, right as the group, the parents were coming to pick up uh, their students, is right when our evacuees started to trickle in uh, and the team did exactly what they should have done. Uh, we all manned our posts. Uh, I, I wanna give a shout out specifically to Jamie, Todd and TJ who were out there um, in the freezing rain doing uh, all the logistics out there and, and guiding and um, putting the people where they needed to be. And they graciously let me stay inside since I was a bad outdoor ed director that day and did not have my outdoor gear on. Uh, so I got to stay in the warm, cozy inside, but they did a phenomenal job of welcoming these fire evacuees, uh, making them feel at home um, and getting their, everyone there safe. Um, and I know you mentioned, Corey, earlier that one of our former um, students was the one that reached out. And I wanted to let Alicia Gerber kind of speak to that just for a moment and it kind of speaks to the impact that we do have at Stone Canyon that some may not realize. So Alicia. Um, yeah, so the young lady from Ravenscrest who reached out to us, uh, she actually started volunteering with our program in 2015 and volunteered every single chance that her teachers would allow her to. Um, she really found a heart for Stone Canyon and education and service. And um, when she graduated, she joined our summer camp and became an employee and a camp counselor for us. And um, really just became part of the fabric and the family at Stone Canyon. And even when she left and she got amazing opportunities to travel the world and find this new community and family with Ravenscrest, um, she, she will always be part of our family. And when she reached out, um, it, was, it was a real no brainer for all of us. Uh, and we were really excited to help her see her again and help help her new community and her new family. So um, it, it was it was a truly uh, amazing opportunity. Well, Jolie and, and team, um, first off, thanks for always doing the extra, thinking of others, um, thinking in, in troubling times, taking care of people and responding to uh, the fires and the evacuees and taking people in and doing the right thing. So. I uh, appreciate you, and again, another round of applause for the work that you do. Final recognition of the evening goes to another uh, great group of staff here in Douglas County, our base staff. You know, we think about uh, what a school district's all about. Uh, we also have to remember uh, those things that, that, that make a difference above and beyond, before school, after school, uh, helping families, helping our staff, and, and the base program uh, does an amazing job. So the DCSD before and after school enterprise has worked uh, nonstop to find ways to provide care and enrichment to children across our district. Um, even with our buildings, uh, when they're closed in the spring, they were finding ways to help and support. And uh, this last April, due to the pandemic, we weren't able to recognize BASE for their incredible accomplishments. Uh, not only do they do great work, uh, they became accredited. And to become accredited, you have to, you have to not only do a great job, but put through the process and be validated by others. Uh, many school di districts have individual before and after school care sites. However, Douglas County School District was the first in the county to seek and earn organizational accreditation through the Council on Accreditation, the COA. On the line with us is Alicia Elmore, Director of BASE and many other BASE staff. Alicia, would you introduce those with you and tell us a little bit more about BASE and the accreditation and the uh, the recognition uh, for earning this. I would be happy to. Thank you so much for this um, opportunity to recognize our staff. And, and actually, we're the first in the whole country, not just our county. So I'm super thrilled about that. And we have um, some of our awesome leaders here. And to get, um, represent, we have um, our base business manager, Valerie Oss, our area managers, Amy Olivas, Michelle Stewart, and Denise Nichols, who started off this whole COA adventure for us. And we have our COA team leaders who helped guide all of our teams through this process. And they represent all of our employees. 
Today we have with us Jessica Anderson, Holly Blanchard, Jessica Carter, Kim Coquet, Karen Dowden, Amy DuPays, Liz Lopez, Tim Musser, Kelly Page, Maureen Pandolfi, Sally Smith, and Kate Spear. And these people helped us through this process of getting accredited, which is really a huge gargantuan CQI process. It took us two years. Um, our, we had endorsers come from across the country. They looked at over 600 pieces of evidence and they went to 19 of our programs. They indicated that some of our points of pride were really our relationships within our schools, with our school communities, our parents, our kids. And one of the things that we really appreciated about it, and I think our staff appreciated about this process was it, it elevated our collaboration to a level we had never had it, seen it before. And we desperately ended up needing it this year. Um, it also brought to light some of the skills that some of our staff had that we didn't know. And so it has really been a true pleasure um, we are thrilled with our staff. I want to thank each and every base staff member for all their hard work. Thank you, thank you. It's an honor to serve you. I want to thank our principals for their collaboration and all the departments that helped us out with this. And thanks to the board um, and to the directors for this recognition. Alicia, thanks to all of you. And another round of applause. You know, this is the, usually the best part of the meeting, and I uh, just want to say it's, it's awesome to see such great people making a difference um, in a number of different ways, and to honor those in our community and our veterans, and uh, again, just an extension out. So this concludes our, our uh, staff and student recognitions, and just once and once again, thank you for your time and joining us. Congratulations, and thank you for everything you're doing to make Douglas County a great place. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wise, and thanks all of you for joining uh, our meeting. We appreciate seeing all your wonderful faces. Um, next on our agenda, board is to accept the agenda. Is there a motion? I move that we accept the agenda. Second. Motion made by Holtzman, seconded by Lung. Let's go ahead and vote. Chancho Shore. Aye. Graziano. Aye. Hanson. And I know Handsome may be temporarily um, gone, so we'll just make note of that for now. And Holtzman? Aye. Lung? Aye. Meek? Aye. Ray? Aye. And that passes unanimously. Next on our agenda is student comment. Uh, this is always a time that we set aside to hear from our students, specifically our student advisory group. And we have Emma Peters here tonight, who's part of the tripod of leadership for our student advisory group. And she's here to report out uh, what uh, our students are working on, but also just to set the tone for us because we are all about students. So Emma, welcome and uh, go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you so much for having me. And Hi. Emma, I'm gonna do a test here to make sure we're getting, getting you picked up. Would you just go ahead and say your name one more time? Yeah, Emma Peters? Yeah, very good. Thanks, Emma. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I just want to start off by saying we had our first all virtual meeting uh, last week with, I think, around like 85 attendees. Uh, so deep respect for everyone in the district who uses Zoom, didn't realize how complicated it was, <laughs> um, and really want to shout you guys out for that. Um, our discussion at the last meeting really focused on how things are going and our return uh, to possible full-time in-person learning in January. Uh, many students are pretty skeptical of the full-time learning uh, in January, just with regards to the rising number of cases, both in our district and across the country. Um, there's definitely were a lot more questions looking towards next school year rather than next semester, uh, kind of with like understanding with everything going on. Um, there was a really big outcry by our student population uh, for mental health focus because um, if this year it's just as a part important, if not more important with COVID and everything going on and the separation between students. Um, definitely a request for a greater focus on that. Um, and then there was also a greater questioning of the attendance policy at this meeting, um, the like the timing specifically being at 10 a.m. Uh, mm -hmm. regarding if it was too early or not. Um, and then questioning what students can do if they complete their course coursework for that day and then are marked absent. So greater clarity on that was definitely requested. 
Um, and then also with regard to online learners, they're feeling extremely separated um, in multiple ways. For example, Fridays, which are already inconsistent between schools, whether it be hybrid, they're also extremely inconsistent for hybrid and e-learners. Um, and then also there seems to be a lack of online aspects for clubs. Um, we did get some confirmation from Mr. Chani uh, that that may be a little bit of a club issue rather than the district issue, um, but it is creating a deeper divide between those online students um, and their access to socialization during this time. Um, and so they were really requesting more interaction with peers and teachers. Um, and then there was also the general sense that coursework is piling up. Um, it was brought up by an AP student claiming um, that the course load, it's just too much to fit in right now with everything going on, whether you be in the hybrid system or online. Um, and that stress is definitely being shown through uh, with teachers and students alike. Um, and as the conversation continued, um, we realized that it was across the entire board, whether it be regular classes or honors classes. Um, and this kind of led to a questioning of the grading scale. Some students were requesting like a pass fail system. Others were suggesting um, changing what an A is maybe from like a 90 to an 85, something along those lines. Um, and then we also, because it was our first virtual meeting, we were able to meet with all of the focus groups um, which is really one of our big things this year. We're using some different resources from Inspired Ed and also the University of Washington's Department of Project Management, because um, we're really pushing for proposals either this May or next May. Um, and then we're also trying a new system with different leaders from within those groups, really hoping to facilitate that communication this year, because obviously that's gonna be a bit of an issue. Um, that's all I have. Do you guys have any questions? Well, first of all, you're very humble because I watched you manage this Zoom meeting of 85 people like a pro. I mean, she, <laughs> you literally put people in breakout rooms like within seconds. Um, so you are the master, Emma. So you, uh, you sell yourself short on, on being challenged by that. But um, um, can you give us, Emma, just an overall sense? I mean, I know you talked about some of the conversation that students had about remote versus hybrid versus in-person, but What's your sense? I mean, tonight that's a big topic for us uh, as a board. And what would you want us as a board to know from a student perspective that we should definitely make sure we pay attention to when we're making and helping our superintendent make that kind of decision about remote versus hybrid? Yeah, um, I do know that a lot of students are really loving hybrid. Um, I do know that's putting a lot of stress on teachers. But with that, there seems to be a general consensus, similar to how it was in March a little bit, that we're kind of preparing to go online here soon. Um, just, I mean, you can tell by the cases and stuff. So really prepping for that. Um, definitely gonna be missed, but I feel like we're definitely more prepared now, whether it be from the hybrid system or just better understanding of what we're doing. Um, and then I can't speak um, to the online learning because I'm not a part of it, but I do know that a lot of the students on the online system are really worried about their lack of interaction that they're getting, um, whether it be with teachers or with their students. So definitely keeping that in mind. Um, part of it too may be with that, that because they're online, they're feeling so isolated, they don't really know how to communicate their ideas for like solutions and stuff. Um, and that's definitely something we're finding within our group and working towards, of course. Um, but just keeping that in mind as you're making those decisions. Sure, thanks. I mean, I know one of your sub, your focus groups is mental health. And any, any hints that you can give us in terms of what that group is looking at right now or um, any, any thoughts about that, any preview, or is it too early to, to, to share that with us? Yeah, um, it's a little early. I would probably have some more information for you by our next meeting. Okay. I can tell you though that uh, one of our liaisons, Mr. Jamie Montoya de Smith, is running a, a meeting, I believe, oh, it was last Friday, um, specifically how to reach out to students right now with mental health um, and just in general. And I think he's trying to create something similar to what the student advisory group is with kind of a panel of students to help be like a direct line to testimonies of what's going on within the district. And I know a lot of the mental health subgroup was pretty interested in that. Um, and I do know that they're also, that's a really a big focus for them is really how do you connect students, especially now with everything maybe going online or being online and different. Um, and so there's definitely, they're looking towards more of how to reach to students in a different way than maybe that's been done before. They definitely, I was in their Zoom, a little breakout room, and they were talking about innovative solutions. Very um, good. 
Very Looking good. Thank, for that. thank you, Emma. Uh, directors, any qu other quick questions for, for Emma regarding student advisory group? Uh, all right, Emma, again, we thank you for joining us. Great, great report, and keep on doing the great work. You are the epitome of what leadership is all about in Douglas County, and we're, we're very proud of you. So um, looking forward to continuing to hear from you guys as the months go by. Thanks again for being here. Thank you. Okay, board directors, next on the agenda is public comment. As you know, we value hearing diverse viewpoints from a broad spectrum of citizens throughout our community, specifically items listed on tonight's agenda and on issues that impact the educational needs of our students. Two policies guide how public comment to the board is received, board policy KE, public complaints, and board policy BEDH, public participation at board meetings. Policy BEDH also explains that since the board is responsible in setting policy uh, for the school district that members of the public should direct their comments towards policy matters and notes further that citizens are, are strongly encouraged to contact the teacher, building principal, or superintendent first with questions or concerns. Board Policy KE outlines the process for responding to grievances and complaints and explains the board believes that complaints and grievances are best handled and resolved as close to the origin of concern as possible. Therefore, we encourage the proper channeling of concerns. For example, concerns that involve a child should begin with the teacher, then the building administrator, director of schools, assistant superintendent, and superintendent before appealing to the board. Given the remote format of this meeting, here are a few additional directions I would like to provide. First of all, as you know, we, as always been our practice, is that we ask that you sign up to um, share public comment by three o'clock before our meeting begins. Those who are signed up receive an email for directions about how to call in. Once called in, your phone will be muted until your name is called. You will be able to listen to the meeting by your phone, but not able to speak. Please make sure that you are not running the meeting on a computer in the background and that you are in a quiet environment. Once I call your name, please state your name and ask if you can be heard. I will respond for you to continue. I would also remind commenters that we want to continue to maintain a decorum of respect and would ask that speakers refrain from using individual names in an offensive manner as this only distracts from the issue of concern. It's also important to note the board follows Robert's rules of orders to guide it in participating in an orderly and fairly conducted meeting. Under those rules, if a director calls for a point of order, all discussions and comments should stop so that a determination can be made as to whether a procedural rule or board policy has been violated. Therefore, if a point of order is made while public comments are made, or if I interrupt, the speaker should pause until otherwise directed to continue. The speaker's phone will be muted until asked to continue. Each speaker tonight is allotted up to three minutes to address the board. Please know that this is our time to just listen without engaging in discussion. So with that, we will go to our first public commenters, um, beginning with Christine Knezovec and Milo Knezovec, um, and then Jesse Sulklin are the three people that we're gonna begin with. Um, Christine, are you there? Yes, my name is Christine Knezovic. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I apologize that I didn't pronounce your last name correctly, <laughs> but thank you. No, that's, that's <laughs> go right. ahead. I'd like to tell you a story. This is a true story, and I'm hoping you can help. This story is about a seventh grade boy who's exhausted by school and homework. And every week he tells me, I wish I was smarter. I wish I could learn better and faster. This boy is our son who attends STEM. He has dyslexia and dysgraphia and a low processing speed disorder. And the same testing that showed those learning difficulties also showed that he is extremely bright to the degree that he should be classified as gifted. Unfortunately, he is not learning in his current environment. He is failing five out of seven of his classes. And while I'm pleased that he's passing PE, I would love for him to be passing all of his other classes too. This is not for lack of trying. He works on homework every day after school until dinner and again until bedtime. He works on homework all day Saturday and Sunday too. He gets so anxious about doing his homework and going to school that some days he will tell me he feels sick and doesn't want to go when I know that it is more mental than a physical ailment. Unfortunately, we've seen this before. Our daughter with some of the same learning issues had many of the same problems when she attended STEM during seventh and eighth grade. She couldn't keep up and her nights and weekends 
were filled with homework to the point that by eighth grade, she was almost mentally broken. We cannot afford for this to happen to another of our children. It took two years at a normal district high school for our daughter to recover and return to her normal self. We want to transfer our son to Crest Hill so that he can have a fresh start with a new learning environment and teachers that may have a different teaching style. Unfortunately, we've received roadblocks throughout the process of pursuing this. No one from STEM will communicate with us since we submitted our application for administrative transfer on October 27th. We feel we're left with only two choices if he cannot be transferred intra-district, withdrawn from STEM and homeschool, or else to pursue private education. Can you help us? Very good. Thank you, Mrs. Knezovich. Milo Knezovich, are you speaking on, I assume, on the same topic? If so, go ahead. Uh, hi there, this is Milo Knezovic. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I believe that... Uh, Go ahead, Milo. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, this is Milo Knezovic speaking. Uh, and I believe that you had a chance to hear my wife, Christine, uh, speak on this subject as well. And at this point of time, we really need your help and assistance. And what's very disheartening is lack of communication or desire uh, to engage in a dialogue. And that hurts as well. That's all I have to say. Very Thank good thing. You. Thank you, sir. Um, I will insert just a couple things um, to, to give you some direction for your next steps. Um, as a charter school, this board doesn't govern the STEM charter school, and so they have certainly a process that I, sounds like you're, you've worked through. If you still are struggling with that process, um, we would ask that you contact Mackenzie Kahn, who's the Director of Choice Programming, and she would be your next step to help you navigate. Um, we're certainly sympathetic to your concerns and the process that you're encountered right now, but please know that this board doesn't have any kind of jurisdiction um, as far as the operations of a charter school. But thank you for sharing your comments tonight. And please contact Mackenzie Kahn, Director of Choice Programming. That would be your next point of contact. Jesse Soklin, are you there? I'm here, Dr. Uh, Mr. Ray, can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Soklin, please go ahead. Okay, I'm a parent of uh, two DCSD uh, students. I wanted to talk about the lack of support I'm seeing for children with IEP. Uh, my son attends Crest Hill Middle with the hybrid program. Uh, in the spring, the special education resources when the schools were shut down really just didn't provide much. And it was a large struggle for him. Now he's attending Crest Hill. He's got some great support at the school, but still struggles on his remote learning days. It takes someone basically fully watching over him to get any of his work done or even his classes attended on the Fridays. The school has him in classes on his uh, in-person days and he's supposed to be getting the special support services on his remote days. Uh, unfortunately, that puts those days and he is not really meeting his IEP needs. Most of the time he doesn't get the services on those days because issues come up with computers, audio. So he's really lacking in those supports. I know the COVID numbers aren't gonna bring secondary students back right now full time, but I wanna make a couple of quick points. Um, students with IEPs really are being missed by the district. They're not providing meaningful services to these kids. The district needs to step up to support for students that are missing what they really need. If the district were to go to full remote, my child would basically lose most his actual learning because he doesn't pay attention remotely. It's easily, he's easily distracted it needs adults to constantly uh, breathe over his shoulder. This resonates with many middle school parents I've spoken to recently. I would in fact encourage the district to find a way to have this type of student in maybe a study hall for IEP kids at the schools on their remote days so they can get the services without interrupting their instructional time. Uh, I would encourage this time can help IEP students receive their legally required services in an effective manner, which right now it feels much like the district is lacking consideration for. Uh, middle schoolers are responsible enough to learn independently, are not responsible enough to learn independently like high schools. 
They are controlled in their social interactions by their parents in terms of not meeting with friends without a mask. Middle schoolers have had less outbreaks, so please keep any plans for going fully remote, possibly with high schools, separate than the middle schools. High schoolers are much more prone to COVID exposure due to their social interactions, work, and sports. So please don't hold these factors against the middle schoolers. I'll also give a quick shout out to uh, Mr. Rendell at uh, Crest Hill. He's trying his best to provide for the students at his school, and he's had minimal quarantines since August. Thank you, Doc, Mr. Ray. Thank you, Mr. Soklin. Nate Ormond is next, and after Nate is Justin Carr. Mr. Ormond, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to use the existing uh, data along with specific DCD uh, SD examples uh, to express some concerns about the decision the board has been making. Um, I'll be focusing on uh, death rates, excess death rates, non-COVID related, remote learning, teacher over pa uh, child parent preference in DCSD specifically, uh, with a focus on the middle school and high schools. Um, First, CDC information is widely available over a significant enough period of time that we can begin making intelligent data-driven decisions. In Colorado, exactly zero deaths um, related to COVID for people under 35 have been noted through the CDC. No uh, school-aged ch uh, children have died from COVID in, in Colorado. In the United States, regular influenza uh, is actually far more deadly for school-aged children, yet we've never behaved like we are now. Uh, for all age cohorts under 65, COVID is less than or roughly equal to the mortality rate for in influenza seen on the CDC. I don't know the average age of teachers or staff in DCSD, but I imagine it's far below 65. Um, the vast majority is in uh, that of the low mortality cohorts. Uh, excess deaths from March uh, through August in the US uh, totaled nearly 200,000 for non-COVID issues because of Google data on driving and cell phone usage was widely available. We can assume that vehicular deaths are actually under the average daily trend for most of this time. That means far more excess deaths were due to under, uh, other underlying and untreated health issues uh, such as suicide, drug addiction, uh, drug addiction, et cetera, um, and, and are at least as numerous as COVID deaths, even including comorbidities, uh, which have, have been shown to be the primary cause of the actual COVID uh, death. Uh, next, there was an MIT uh, study that was done over 10 years uh, tracking the online shift to remote learning in the California Community College and showed that online learners do less well across the board. They're less likely to pass their course and they're more likely to receive a lower grade than students who attended classes in person. Uh, this was a study for more mature student population and who had more years to develop the discipline skill set needed to show success in a remote learning environment. Uh, because our students have been suddenly thrust in this environment, I would assume the success rate will be even lower. Uh, uh, there was a further study uh, reported in the New York Post 10 11 2020 that showed that schools are not super spreaders for COVID. Uh, finally, specific to DCSD, it appears that since the outbreak, teachers' desires have been placed above the needs of the students and the parents for whom the teachers are ostensibly hired to provide the service to. Uh, as evidence, I would point to the original survey results and the nearly exact opposite results for teachers versus parents. And yet, preference was overwhelmingly given to the desires of the uh, teachers. Uh, the fact that there was a misleading email sent uh, one day prior to the election noting that due to budget cuts the school staff would not be in school obscured the fact that this was already a scheduled day off for the vote uh, this was in fact an election in which 95 percent of coloradans returned their ballot by mail anyway this cut time available for in-person instruction by 50 percent for that week under a COVID schedule and 80 percent relative to a normal schedule it's totally unacceptable to not have any modification or consideration for the current environment in terms of trying to figure out how to maximize in-person learning opportunities. Uh, the, the, the PSAT prep results um, uh, resulted in a, a similar reduction in in-person uh, learning opportunities. Um, opportunities to provide student in-person, teachers by Zoom, and proctored by low-risk populations could be one solution. I'm sure there are many others that are focused on achieving normalized in-person opportunities as opposed to maximizing, uh, maximizing catering uh, to the whims of the teachers unions. I would submit that you are contributing to excess deaths from non-COVID reasons, as reported earlier. And I would further submit that you are contributing to long-term negative societal, uh, societal impacts and educational attainment of an entire generation of students. Uh, if you and the teachers um, you know, continue to want to abdicate your role in the educational and societal development of our kids, at least be honest about it, so that parents can make on, uh, honestly informed decisions regarding their kids, free up the DCSD budget for true self-directed educational resources and solutions. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Ormond. 
Justin Carr is next, and then Joelle Chambers. Mr. Carr, are you there? Joelle Chambers. Yes, I'm here. Can you oh, hear me? Sorry. Yes. Mr. Carr, please go ahead. Uh, directors, uh, as a community member and a partner of a teacher in Douglas County, I have to say I'm currently apoplectic. Uh, the district's response to this most recent wave of coronavirus has uh, been shameful. While multiple grades and multiple additional classrooms for a total of 10 classrooms in a single school are in quarantine, you continue to allow that school to operate as if nothing is wrong, just so it doesn't show on your list of quarantine schools. Your lack of transparency and your outright blazing dis disregard for health and safety of your students and staff is unacceptable. With Douglas County at its highest virus incidence rates ever in, and in the highest category according to state data, and with Thanksgiving break on the horizon, you are plowing towards a situation that will endanger the lives of many. And while I know that you may consider tonight moving to, remote, to move to a remote posture after Thanksgiving break, I am here to tell you that that timetable is too late. By not moving to a defensive remote posture now, such as Cherry Creek School District, which you have previously held up as a beacon of example, you endanger not just the lives of your students and staff, but of their parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents. And while you can wash your hands by saying that individuals should make decisions for the safety of their own families, you cannot be so ignorant as to believe that by not taking proactive measures, you will be endangering and potentially killing loved ones. The existence of your six foot distancing stickers, which are by the way, two to three feet apart in common areas of your schools and your useless alcohol-free hand sanitizer will not stop the pandemic from raging throughout our community, nor will it erase your complacency. I urge you to take decisive action tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carr. Joelle Chambers is next, and after Joelle is Nicole Moulton. Joelle, are you there? I am, can you hear me? Yes, Ms. Chambers, please go ahead. Good evening. Um, thank you for taking this time to hear us, and I wanted to address not only the board members, but I wondered about who else was in attendance tonight. Cabinet members are here with, with us as well. Okay. Um, I especially wanted to um, make sure that um, Officer Ingalls was in attendance as how this has affected me is directly related to my son with, who is on an IEP. Um, but each of you, I believe, are there to advocate for the um, education of our students. And I just wanted, I wanted to echo and commend Mr. Sockland and Mr. Orman, Ormond who just spoke um, about how this is affecting our kids. Um, absolutely, Mr. Sockland's child on IEP is, I want to echo that for every student in your district. You are, those are legal documents that you are not upholding at this time um, and will be even worse if you choose to go to remote learning. Um, and Mr. Ordman had, a, had some very well um, said information about the data that I would implore you guys to look at the actual data in our county. Um, the numbers do not warrant the, scare, the scared fear mongering that we heard from our last husband of a teacher. Um, we the hospitals are at 11% capacity, 12% COVID information. This is all information that's on our Tri-County Health Department website that I would implore you guys to look at this evening as you make this decision for our students. In the ages that are at school, it's just not a death threat. This is not something that we should be fearing. We have come a long way since March when school was closed with the treatment and how we live through this virus. Um, you can see from the data that our children and the staff at the schools are not in a place that should be afraid, that should be closing down our schools. Um, there, um, let's see. You're leaving a whole demographic behind that cannot learn by remote if you, if you choose to close our schools. So I'm asking Ms. Ingalls to advocate for our students that even if, if you do choose to deny 
the general population in education over the next few months, please think of our students who cannot learn remotely. Those are the students that are on IEPs and SSN. Their teachers and the staff in those programs want to stay in school and are willing to stay in school. They are teaching my stu our students the only way that they can learn and they want to be there. So please, as you make this decision tonight, think about these kids and make the option to have our SSN students still go to school. I would like you to allow everyone to go to school. Um, but for me personally, that's where I, um, where it hits me personally. And also I would like to you guys to, um, to consider what your job is and what your role as a board of education and as the officers of this district, that your job is to educate our students and to give us the option for them to learn. You've given that option to the students who decide that it's that they are, don't want to make take the risk to go to school. So please give that option to the rest of the students who need in-person education. My son has been quarantined more than half of the days that he should have been in school. That is not acceptable because every day that he's home, he does not learn. It's not, it's not a possibility. So when you decide to close this in-person learning, you are taking away 100% of his learning. I would just really love for you, each of you to consider this as you make this decision tonight for the benefit, for the advocating and for caring about the students in the SSN programs on IEPs and every student that would like to be in school. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Chambers. Nicole Knowlton is next and then Jamie Woldridge. Nicole Knowlton, are you there? One more time for Nicole Knowlton, are you there? Okay, we're gonna move on to Jamie Woldridge. Jamie, are you there? I am, can you hear me? Yes, Ms. Woldridge, please go ahead. Hi, good evening. Thanks, Dr. Ray, I appreciate your guys' time. Um, my name is Jamie Woldridge. I am a mom of four kids um, in Douglas County Schools, four different levels, two of which actually have special needs, um, one in the elementary level and one at the secondary high school level. Um, I can speak from a mom's perspective, but also as an educator, um, I'm a school counselor. I actually took this year off to support my children because I knew I could see the writing on the wall and I knew that there was going to be a need for it, especially in my home. Um, <clears throat> I can see with my kids, but obviously other kids, the impact of remote learning on social, emotional, and academic um, you know, my ninth grader specifically is on a 504 plan. He has um, a handful of needs such as ADHD, anxiety, OCD, and he's on the spectrum. Um, although he actually is doing pretty, pretty well. He's a ninth grader and luckily he was able to get the foundations during the um, elementary years that many of our kids are not, are not getting right now, such as my second grader who is my major concern. Um, he was at grade level last year during first grade and now due to COVID and since COVID is now in, a, in an RTI reading group every day during remote learning, he cries during the from the stress and the frustration and exasperation. Um, I realize that this is my reality, but this could be, this reality could be mirrored in any home at any point during um, it, it, during this time, um, I speak to many moms in our community, and um, I know that this is a shared feeling amongst many, many people. We were fortunate to be able to go back in the elementary um, age group uh, to go to full-time learning October 17th, and I was able to see an immediate change in my second grader's overall demeanor. Um, I had even spoken to his principal to share that um, you know, happiness that he was back to his own self and, and, and happy in his social um, and emotional um, classroom. Um, uh, however, last night we received an email at 5 p.m. that his class was now going to be quarantined um, for the next 15 days. Uh, we had 15 hours notice for what was described as just symptoms of COVID, but no actual positive test. Um, and I guess my question for you all would be, 
At what point did the guidance from the Tri-County Health Department change from COVID positive tests to just symptoms? Um, in the same email that was offering instructions for quarantine for my second grader that included not attending uh, other social gatherings, functions, et cetera, they also advised us that my other sibling, my other children, his siblings, which I have four, like I said, um, are, are able to continue to resume attending school and other functions as well as my husband and myself, which um, is questionable. Uh, quarantine is defined as a place of isolation based on exposure to infectious disease. And so I guess my question would be, please be specific in how you came to this approach and justification and rationale based on symptoms during cold and flu and allergy season. I feel that there is a lack of accountability for who is the ultimate decision maker in this process. And there's a lot of finger pointing and hiding behind canned answers that handcuff families that are just trying to support our local community schools, which is what we want to do. But ultimately we have no rights and there is no transparency and there's no line of sight um, into how these decisions are being made. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Boldridge. We're gonna circle back to Nicole Knowlton and after Nicole Knowlton is Meredith Likes. Nicole, are you there? This is Nicole Knowlton, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Ms. Knowlton, please go ahead. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I am a parent to a kindergartner and a third grader in DCSD, and I wanted to address the possibility of potentially transitioning elementary students from in-person learning to 100% remote learning. I know that COVID cases are on the rise and there are instances of symptomatic people, as the previous caller mentioned, and actual confirmed COVID cases in DCSD. However, I think it's important that we also focus on the positive. There are many elementary schools that are thriving and successfully remaining open, even though they have maybe one or two positive cases in their student population. These schools are taking prop proper safety measures and following all quarantine protocols. The thought of transitioning all DCSD elementary students to a 100% remote model, even for a short period of time, is extremely disheartening. The students who are currently 100% in person started with a hybrid model and then transitioned to full time. Adding 100% remote would add yet another model for students, teachers, and parents to adjust to. We need to offer our children consistency and proper in-person instruction. Without that, they are denied the opportunity for proper education. I can speak for my children, and I know many, many others, when I say that remote education for elementary age children is not effective. In addition, it is nearly impossible for working parents to accommodate the demands associated with remote learning. I've been advised that should we go remote, we should plan for live sessions throughout the entire day. While I think that approach is ideal in a perfect world, it simply does not work. Elementary students need unwavering assistance and guidance through their remote learning process. It is a full-time job. Working parents cannot accommodate this. I encourage you to think about the students who do not have the necessary support system at home. What happens to them in the remote learning model? Please consider all options when keeping that keep elementary schools in the classroom full-time. And my final note would be that if you do make changes to the model, DCSD needs to be in a position to, to pivot back to in-person learning on the fly. In September, when DCSD made the decision to move from hybrid to in-person, a four-week prep window was allocated. Knowing that COVID cases would likely surge in the fall, we wasted prime time that students could have been in the classroom. Should we change the model in any way, there should be a solid plan to return to in-person ASAP and there should be proper directives in place to ensure that this happens as quickly as possible. Four weeks of waiting is far too long. Please keep our elementary students in the classroom full time. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Knowlton. Meredith Likes is next, and then Lisa Kochevar. Meredith, are you there? I am here. Go How ahead. are you? Yeah, fine. Go ahead, and go ahead, Ms. Likes. Good, thank you. Thanks for having me again. Um, before I begin with my prepared comments, I want to say thank you to Nate. He spoke um, a few people ago, and I've actually appreciated a lot of the comments tonight, but I did want to point out Nate, um, who provided a lot of amazing and accurate information that's relevant data um, in regard to what's going on with COVID and 
what needs to be considered with in-person learning and so much more. I just really appreciated Nate's comments and I hope that you'll go back and um, reevaluate this data and take it into consideration as you continue with your meeting tonight. Um, just last week, a new health order was released stating that local and school district officials will be responsible to decide whether students should attend in-person classes or virtual lessons online. Essentially, Governor Polis has declared that schools are essential businesses. With that said, it is entirely up to the school district, namely the school board and acting superintendent to determine if they are going to deem themselves essential or not. You no longer have the crutch of the governor to say you shouldn't be open for 100% in-person learning at all school levels. I know you currently have some grades and even some entire schools out for a two week quarantine, but even with the quarantine obstacles, it is essential to push forward and open all schools. In essence, in half of our, in essence, if you consider, in half of our, if half of our neighborhood school students had to be quarantined, our district would still have roughly 25,000 students who can still be in the classroom, classroom learning in person. And that is significant and important to consider. That's a lot of kids. You've created a system and protocols to handle virus cases and exposure. Either it works or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, schools have been unsafe since August. I believe it is working. I have seen with my own eyes on a daily basis that these systems and protocols are working and they can work in schools with 100% in-person learning. Every day it saddens me to think that many students don't have the opportunity or the option to be in school 100% in, per in person. You need to have faith in your systems that you created and get all kids back to school 100% in-person learning. At the very least, don't make your decision tonight, dis or see, um, please don't have our Douglas County students go on full remote. I've heard the news that you are planning to make the decisions during the meeting tonight that you would like schools to go fully remote. It is crucial that you consider schools being essential for our students and communities. Kids need schools and you more than anyone need, need to know that so far or should know that. So far, they have not been in a normal school environment since March. They have missed out on so many academic opportunities. I would implore you to, to decide to move swiftly forward and open our middle and high schools, high schools and not backwards by closing all schools and moving to remote learning. At the very least, don't make your decision tonight district-wide. Give your feeder school communities the option to make decisions for themselves. Surely not every feeder area needs to go fully remote. It makes no sense to make that a district-wide decision. Give each feeder area the directive of the state and allow them to make decisions for themselves based on their situation. Last month, I attended a school-approved community activity at my local high school. It was a fun event and extremely well attended. The line into the event wrapped halfway around the school building, filled with parents and kids and high school students eager to participate in a school community activity. The turnout was much greater than expected. My takeaway from this was that our school community is eager to get back to normal. Parents and students want school and school activities to resume. I know the principal at my local high school knows his school community, including students, staff, and parents the, the best, much better than any district employee or board member. Our principals need to be allowed to do their job and do what's best for their school and feeder communities. Don't be weak and incompetent as board members and leaders in this district and set us back by closing schools again. Be trailblazers, and innovative and forge ahead. Show true leadership to get all student, all district students back to school in person five days a week. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Likes. Lisa Kochevar is next and then Olivia Carbonaro. Lisa, are you there? I am. 
Um, can all of you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Perfect. Um, thank you for listening to me tonight, and uh, congratulations to BASE for getting um, getting their accolades, and to Emma. I really liked her comments. I don't have any prepared statement this evening, which is probably a good thing after listening to so many impassioned parents. But I have two high schoolers. <clears throat> they are part of the JAG community at Rock Canyon, and we're proud to be there. But I received an email today from the JAG community, and I'm going to quote here. We are currently dealing with over the 20 to 30 staff absences on a daily basis. Some of these jobs are unfilled, which requires us to creatively cover classes and other responsibilities. Second portion of the email is, this is causing significant disruption to our daily operations. Overall, we're doing everything we can to keep students and staff in school, but we want to be transparent and share that it's becoming increasingly difficult. Listening to many of the impassioned parents this evening, many of them are calling for more of a dynamic and not a static decision. So I would ask that maybe the board can consider something like that for schools that are not affected by COVID numbers spiking, that they stay in school and maybe even return to school full time. For the rest of like the JAG community at Rock Canyon, it seems like they're struggling and might need some time to take off and recover. And um, it doesn't seem like they might make it to Thanksgiving. So anyway, those are, that is my input. Thank you very much for hearing me out tonight. I appreciate it. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Kochevar. Olivia Carbonaro is next, and then Callie Leva. Olivia, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead. Hi, Dr. Ray. Thank you for having me. I am um, speaking on behalf of teachers and students in our district. I have already brought this question to our administration, our school nurse, risk management, and now the board. My question is this. If students are not required to get tested for COVID-19, even after being exposed to someone in their home with a confirmed positive case, how can we ensure that this child is not a positive case as well, and that the staff and the students who were around this child prior to them going into quarantine have not already been exposed? We are told that if that student wasn't showing major symptoms and there is no need for their classmates or teachers to quarantine. However, science has shown us that children can be asymptomatic carriers of the virus. And without requiring them to get tested, how do we know if they are a carrier or not? Why aren't all family members of a positive case being required to get tested so contact tracing can properly and effectively be carried out to ensure the safety of students and staff? In addition to this, teachers are being asked at a moment's notice to teach the students at home in quarantine while still engaging with students in class. We were promised at the beginning of this year that we would not be asked to do both, to teach in person and online, but that's exactly what is happening. I agree students in quarantine still deserve access to education, but why does all of this fall on the classroom teachers who are already under immense amounts of stress? Why are teachers given no support to simultaneously be an in-person teacher and an e-learning teacher, all the while getting paid less this year than the last. How do you expect to keep teachers in this profession when you set expectations so high that their mental health has begun to crumble? I sincerely hope the district will make proactive choices instead of reactive for the safety and well-being of our communities. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Carbonaro. Callie Leba is next. After Callie is Darcy Diano. Callie, are you there? I am, Director Ray. Can you hear me? Yes, Ms. Leba, please go ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, good evening. Thank you all for your work, your dedication, your commitment, and your time. My name is Callie Leba, and I'm speaking on behalf of the membership of the Douglas County Federation because although I tried to get teachers to talk to you tonight, most told me they were just too overwhelmed to add one more thing to their plates. The decisions you're being asked to make are impossible. There's no decision that every member of our community or staff would agree upon, and our members recognize the position you and the rest of DCSD leadership is in. I think we'll get through this more successfully by acknowledging the challenges we are all facing and that any solution must be best for the community as a whole, not for any one group. 
But of course, the group that all decisions must be centered around are the students. Parents are certainly facing real difficulties with any delivery of education other than 100% in person. However, the sheer number of quarantines families are dealing with makes even that option a struggle. Our greater community is also affected by our decisions because we don't have enough testing or tracing to be sure that we're not contributors to the overall skyrocketing numbers in our state. Several of you have acknowledged that teachers and school staff are overwhelmed and that the current state is unsustainable. Thank you for that. I would add that the entire DCSD staff is in the same position, including our nurses, directors, other administrators, really everyone, including board members. I don't know any teachers who would choose to switch from hybrid or in-person to remote, but nearly every teacher I've talked to has resigned themselves to accepting that this switch to full remote is inevitable. I don't think you should make a decision like this based on what people want, though. This isn't something that a survey should dictate. Data should dictate this decision. What the data doesn't show clearly, though, is the disruption to education caused by the constant quarantining at all levels of our schools. Consistency is one of the bedrocks of education. So while we don't have established best practices for education in a global pandemic, we can apply what we know about children and how they learn and recognize that we owe them consistency. We also know that our students deserve teachers who can be the most effective in educational delivery. The disruptions from quarantines or delivering education to some kids at home on quarantine while others are in the classroom or following up on students who aren't even attending when they're out on quarantine are detrimental to the quality of instruction our teachers can offer. Again, this consistency is lacking for our students. Since we can't make a decision that works for all parents or all staff or all teachers, I propose that we make the very best decision we can for our students and the adults will figure out a way to make it work. Thank you to everyone from our school staff and teachers, to every support personnel and administrator in our district. Thank you to our families and thank you to our community. Everyone is facing extraordinary challenges and for the most part, we are all getting through this together. As always, the DCF wants to help and is ready to collaborate. Thank you, Ms. Leba. Darcy Diano is next. Darcy, are you there? Ms. Diano, are you there? Okay, Ms. Diano, you may be still muted, so we're gonna give you another minute. And um, yeah, I did see a message that says that she may be watching the YouTube and that's always delayed. So if you're watching the YouTube, um, unfortunately it's not the actual moment by moment. But again, uh, Darcy Diano, we'll give you a few more seconds and then we'll need to close public Can you comment. hear me? Oh, there she is. Yes, Ms. Diano, go ahead. Um, I am gonna start by saying I am not as eloquent as much as Kate Talley is, but I will say I am one of the teachers that is speaking, even though I have plenty to do tonight. So it's not very um, organized, I'll do my best. Um, we all know that in-person learning and teaching is the best the best form of learning and education. I am not questioning that, but as my principal has said, staying hybrid is not, it's just not possible to sustain. I believe we really need to listen to who is in the trenches. The administration see the building day to day, but the teachers see the classroom day to day and every day. Uh, although I respect the board members and the parents of our community, let's listen to a teacher this time. I am a teacher and I was quarantined for two weeks after I started the hybrid schedule. My students went fully remote with me every day. So I'd like to give some of my thoughts about full remote learning. We became one big class all together online every day. The only difference was a screen between them and I. 
My students could still ask me immediate questions with immediate answers. They could show me their artwork as they were working, and they still saw me, and I still saw them. There are two other big aspects we need to consider when moving forward with the full-time online learning. Consistency. It does not matter what grade your child is in, but every child and person needs consistency. Kids and adults crave a routine instead of the unknown every day. We were told just today that we are going remote tomorrow. That's not much time to get organized for parents of little children or teachers that need to start over with their lessons. Safety is a second thing we need to talk about. DC revolves around safety, thinking, and speaking, but there is nothing safe about COVID. Do we want to risk lives that, do we want to risk the lives who do not seem safe, that does not seem safe, sorry. Safety also includes mental health. I am an adult having a hard time um, regularly dealing with my stress, which ultimately leads to depression. I could not imagine being a five-year-old brain and understanding how I am feeling, but cannot put those feelings into words. Those uh, stated feelings will lead to many issues in the future. There are positives and negatives about any situation. Let's look at the positive of full online learning. Consistency and safety are all huge positives for everyone involved. No one wants this to happen, no one in our school, but no one wanted COVID in our world. P.S. Reinstating a CBS would help take care of these many questions. Bring teachers back to the table so we finally have a voice again. Thank you, Ms. Thank Diano. You. Thank you, Ms. Diano. All right. That closes our public comment, and thank you to all our public commenters. Please know that your comments, along with the hundreds of emails that this board has received over the last couple of weeks, we have certainly heard, listened to, and we will certainly incorporate that into our thinking as we continue to discuss that tonight. So we encourage you certainly to um, continue to view this meeting because you'll continue to hear some of your thoughts reflected and maybe some of your questions answered as we continue on our agenda. Next on our agenda board is the consent agenda, which has eight items. Those items are long range planning committee membership recommendations, uh, world class academy um, grant, personnel changes, a second amendment to the build agreement for the fire alarm system replacements, a change order for Castleview High School's FPOD, workday subscription contract renewal, and an exclusive right to sell listing contract with CBRE and our 2021 first quarter financial report. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move that we approve the consent agenda. Second. Motion made by Holtzman, seconded by Lung. Let's go ahead and vote. Director Chancha Shore. Aye. Graziano. Aye. Hansen. Hansen. Wonder Aye. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Director Holtzman. Aye. Director Lung. Aye. Meek. Aye. Ray. Aye. Consent agenda passes unanimously. Next on the agenda is to approve the unofficial minutes, and these minutes are actually for two meetings, not only our last meeting on October 20th, but also the minutes for our work session that we held on October 24th. Is there a motion to approve the unofficial minutes? I move to approve the unofficial minutes. Second. Second. Motion made by Meek and seconded twice by Graziano and Holtzman. <laughs> Let's go ahead and vote. Chancho Shore? Aye. Graziano? Aye. Hansen? Aye. Holtzman? Aye. Lung? Aye. Meek? Aye. Ray? Aye. Passes unanimously. Next on our agenda, interim superintendent Mr. Wise will again give us some updates regarding some of the topics we've heard tonight from our public commenters as well as some other things that will be important for us to consider as we continue to move forward as a school district. Mr. Weiss. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, like to start with a little bit of just a DASC update, the Denver Area Superintendent Council. Um, as we look at the comments, you see the struggle that's happening throughout our, 
our school system. Um, every district's finding similar struggles with rising rates, uh, quarantines, how do we maintain, uh, what are the tipping points? So as we look at that, having specific conversations with Cherry Creek, um, who had to push out remote, uh, having conversations with Littleton, who has been working very similar to us, to look at individual schools, look at tipping points of schools, uh, and trying to work with, with safety, number of teachers who are out with positive cases and or quarantined, uh, subpositions and unfilled subpositions of can you actually carry on a school day, uh, and having to push out schools that uh, they're in a very similar spot to us being a neighboring district. You see our, our numbers going up very similarly within the, the surrounding areas right around us. Elbert County, um, Jeffco. You know, the update is we're all, we're all working really hard. So we talk about creative solutions. Uh, as Douglas County, we've implemented a system where we try to look at each individual school. As we start to have positive cases and quarantines, we start to measure those schools by, by different ratios. And we talk about numbers, it's not just a hard set stone number because there are a lot of impacts. But at an individual school, when you have 20% of your staff out, can you carry on a school day? When you have sub rates and you can't fill sub positions in your own school, let alone across the district because the number of schools that are facing that. Um, we've found ways in which we keep schools in and we're trying to fight hard to do that. We've also had to find ways where we push out schools, as you've, heard, as you've heard tonight. You know, currently, going into tomorrow, we have nine schools who are remote for 14 days. We have four high schools. When we look at those numbers, the ability to have quality education, sustain that, to look at what's best for students, staff, and our community, we're working really hard to, to look at every individual school. And as we're doing that, we're trying to, to look at not only areas, but who is being impacted and who isn't. As a parent of a, of a student in one of our high schools, I see those emails also every day of quarantines. And I wonder at times, uh, when is my daughter gonna be quarantined? When could our school possibly go remote? And it just happened. So to empathize with that, and you look at the, the DASC piece, I think the important part that I want you to hear is uh, we're not alone. Um, this is, as we start to look at the data, the impacts, making decisions, making recommendations for decisions as schools and as a district, we take it seriously. We're trying to listen to everybody. We are trying to find those creative ways. We're working hard to keep schools open, uh, but we're also measuring those tipping points. Last night, we, our special ops team cleaned 30 schools. We have five people on that special ops teams that go to every school after school and in the evenings and in the early mornings cleaning. They have another 14 to 15 schools tonight. I didn't get the update of added schools going on, but ending the day going into this meeting, uh, we're upwards of, of 14 to 15 more. We lost two special ops people. We've had to train our building custodians at the high school level and work at the middle school level to carry it on to make sure we can disinfect each night. Our school nurses, how we contact Trace and work with Tri-County. In order for us to have a school open, hybrid or in person, we have to contract trace, keep data records, and the work that puts on to those school nurses and district nurses, they're a specialty group. You look at the need for nurses in all the, the healthcare agencies and in our school district and other school districts, they're at a tipping point. So how we balance that and maintain it, we're working hard to do that. We're working hard to recruit more people in to be on our special ops team, to be in our district nurses, and then you look at our communications group with all the letters going out. We're sending out letters even of schools that are closed because we have more quarantines because we have to report out the safety piece of positive cases so those kids that might be positive, they have to quarantine because they can't be working. They can't do their normal events. So even when a school is remote, we still have to continue that data tracking with our nurses, with our communications department and others. And we're working hard. So I want you to know this, uh, we're, we're kicking and biting and scratching and fighting. I don't think we can always explain at times what the work happens in this process. It's not just the teachers and the number of whether we do hybrid and who's quarantined and who's not. There's a lot of other work that goes on behind the scenes that you don't always see and it's dependent on specialty groups, limited numbers. We need more substitutes. Had a great conversation with the family 
uh, today or this past week that would like us to continue to stay open. And I agree. And I'll give her credit. She's working with our, our HR department to become a sub. So anybody that's out there that's listening that would like to be a sub, uh, reach out to us. We need more subs. Our sub fill rate today was 70%. It should be in the 90s. We're paying more for our subs so we can get more, and we're at 70% today. We're close to 300 subs needed. So in order to have a school open, we have to have the personnel to do that. Um, if you are a nurse or know a school nurse or a nurse, um, please apply. We need you. So we will hire key positions to add in staff where it's needed, especially in these key areas. So do know, as you look at that piece, uh, uh, we'll continue that get communication out to you um, and try to recruit you. So on that side, that's kind of a, an update a little bit and a prelude to what's going to continue to, to, to be shared. But I think sometimes saying the most important things more than once is needed. So um, I'm going to switch over as we start talking about uh, um, our COVID numbers. I'm going to turn over to Matt Reynolds. And we're going to keep going with that. It will also hit our other topics as we look at um, everything that we're trying to talk on. As we talk about planning and preparation, uh, we're going to build in some conversation of what our work will be um, as schools and to prepare and give families, if we have to go to remote time, to give teachers time and preparation uh, because it's a big shift if that happens. And we need to continue to watch that data um, and watch all our metrics. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wise. Mr. Reynolds. Chief Assessment and Data Officer for the School District. Uh, good evening, Directors. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak again uh, regarding our dashboard. Uh, this seems to be a recurring theme uh, with each meeting for us to discuss um, the data that's available and the data of what we've seen uh, within the past time that we've uh, had conversations. Um, this is um, an, an update that I provided um, as of today. Uh, this, this is data that I pulled off of the website and you can see through our indicators A through E, uh, we are currently um, outside the realm of the possibility of in red on all of the indicators that are here. Um, I'm going to get into a little bit more detail of that by showing you the source of the data, which is our Tri-County Caution Metrics for Schools. Um, so that's where we are for these particular metrics. Um, they include uh, the 14-day case numbers, um, the trends in numbers for the last two weeks, our positivity, um, the number of hospitalizations, and also the trend uh, for the students are for school-aged children from 5 to 18. Uh, this is our own internal data um, where we have uh, the first line is regarding our PPE supply. Um, this is where we have stocked enough supply to get us through at least for a month, uh, which is our goal to make sure that we have enough of that supply to handle the needs. Um, the next two categories of both staff and students, these are our weighted score average for quarantine, isolate, uh, isolated, and also positive case. You'll notice that I have two of those that are highlighted. Uh, these are two uh, data points that we have been looking at over the last few months. It's also a, a topic of conversation amongst um, our other school districts as well um, is, you know, we have our own local uh, tri-county health data and our local data for our uh, county. The, the, the question is, how do we handle our own internal data regarding our own rates of positivity, quarantines, and isolations? Um, and I will say that this is an area for, for growth for us for this year. Um, knowing when we first established this, we were working in the summer based on the guidance that we had at hand. Well, now that we're into it um, over a quarter, we've been able to see the full effect of having these things. Uh, for example, when you have one case, what's the full impact of a school system and what's our response to one positive case? So we've been able to see that. And that's something that other districts have also seen. Um, in addition to that, between now and the summer, we've also seen our own health departments at the state level and our own local tri-county health change their own metrics regarding how they display and handle these data on their website. Uh, we did talk about that the last time uh, with this particular data set, the fact that they had switched that to the dial dashboard. Um, so they have changed not only the way that that data looks, but also the rating scales that are within it. 
So we have an opportunity, I believe, in this case to really examine our own internal data and work with our partnering districts to look at how we classify these different cut scores to truly uh, match the reality of where we're at. Um, the best example I can give you is um, if we look at a high school that has 2,000 students. Um, currently, positive case, we stay green with 5% or less. So out of you know, 2,000 kids, we're talking about 100 students that, are, that could potentially be positive. We know from our experience that would be classified as an outbreak. And our response to that would be vastly different. And when we do the contact tracing and, and do our work with quarantining, that 5% would basically close that school down. So we're re-examining our data and we've come up with some other theoretical um, cut points for our own data based on what we're seeing in our school system and what we're also seeing from other districts to look at what that data point really means. So we'll be coming back to you with this data so that you can see. And we've got some theoretical uh, data points uh, that we'll also discuss. Um, this is the source uh, for our data. These are the uh, caution metrics for schools. Uh, you will see that at the top, we have crossed that threshold of, of 350. That is that uh, red line here, this metric, which is that dial threshold, uh, where they put us at a stay-at-home uh, level in their, according to their metrics. Uh, we also have uh, the percent change in the two weeks incidence has us at a 55%, which again exceeds their... 50% uh, increase as being high. So both of those indicators are red, which is why on the previous two slides we had a zero. Uh, one thing I do want to point out is we have a graph at the bottom that shows our incidence rate over time. Two things for us to, to monitor and be aware of. One is we have our three counties of Adams, Arapaho, and Douglas. Um, all three of the counties have crossed over that 350 threshold. But in addition to that, it's the slope of that line. So not only is it the height of the line, but it's also the slope that shows the rapid changing nature that we're facing right now uh, within the three counties. Next, uh, these are the other three indicators, the two-week positivity, the change in hospitalizations, and also the two-week incidence rates for uh, children ages 5 through 18. Again, you can see that we have crossed a threshold uh, for this 10% which puts us at uh, safer at home, which is that uh, level three, which is orange, and I'll get into that detail in a little bit. Um, the other two categories are we're in the high. We've passed the thresholds for both of those indicators. Again, at the bottom, we have a graphical representation, which shows um, we are the, uh, I guess, the green color down here. You can see that we've had some variations in our data over time. We've discussed that in previous meetings, that we do see that up and down nature. Um, but I do want to call your attention to this uh, spike at the end where we do see a dramatic increase in a very, very short time. Um, and that's a thing that, um, as our inner superintendent Wise did discuss a minute ago, we're talking to our neighbors who are also residing in these counties about similar trends that they're seeing in their districts and just how fast uh, these metrics are changing. Uh, this is our, our road to return dashboard indicator. Uh, currently, we're sitting at a six, which is we're, we're getting awfully close to that framework score of zero to four. Um, again, this is something that I, I do want to revisit when we get to it. Um, as he has indicated earlier, it's not just the, the raw data that we're seeing here. It's also our response to that data that puts the stress. Uh, for every positive case that we have, we have to do contact tracing and we have to go through the proper protocols and how to respond. Um, and that takes hours for us to be able to do that and it's impacting our students, it's impacting our staff, and it's impacting our parents. Um, this is currently where we're sitting on the dial dashboard. This is from the Colorado Department of uh, Public Health and Environment. Um, that's this dial over here. We're right there in the center. Um, this dial is something that's new in terms of some of the, the language that they're using. Um, they used to use lever levels names. Now they use the color to describe where we are. So we're actually in uh, the yellow area. Um, again, you can see uh, the different metrics that are associated with having us land in here, and we're watching that very closely. Uh, we'll get an update on that dial metric uh, very, very soon. Uh, we're thinking within the next week to see, based on our metrics from the previous two slides, whether or not we're going to be moved to this orange level. With each of these different levels, we have new uh, restrictions that are added. 
So I did want to spend a little bit of time. Uh, this change was very recent. Uh, we went into yellow, uh, I want to say about 10 days ago. Uh, these are some of the restrictions, and I picked a few of them just to give a, a common point of reference. Uh, we're at uh, the K-12 line here where um, in-person hybrid remote as appropriate. Um, that's the, the current state uh, of where we're at. Um, you can see that you know, they do recommend for personal gathering size that's up to 10, no more than two households. These are the restrictions that come with each one of those dial markers. So as our public health department reviews our data and puts us in one of these different categories, we experience different levels of restrictions. Uh, the darker that color is, the more red that color is, the more restrictions we do have. Uh, one thing I do want to paint uh, a picture of is if we do move to this level of orange, there are two major things that do come up. Uh, one is our ability to do target uh, tracing. That is one thing that we do lose that ability to do that. Um, our high schools right now are taking advantage of that. Um, and I did put a link in there on what targeted contact identification is. That's our ability to go through and look at um, each individual class and look at who has been a close contact within students who have been positive or exhibiting symptoms of being positive. Um, so rather than shutting down whole classes, we're able to go into classrooms and figure out who has been in close contact with those children. We lose that ability once we're moved from yellow to orange. Um, and that's going to be a very big impact to our system uh, because one or two cases in a high school, if you're doing it class by class, can really impact our ability to provide service. Um, and provide coverage for the, the, the students in that school. The other thing that does change is that recommendation. Uh, they do change as appropriate to um, limit the in-person. They actually make that recommendation within their uh, dial framework as well. Um, a few things I did want to point out uh, for school closures. Um, as we have discussed already, we do have several schools that are in closure. Um, it's not necessarily one thing that brings us to that idea of a school closure, there's different things that are available. Uh, this is a, a list uh, that has been provided by CDPHE that schools should be closed if any of the following apply. And I did highlight two of them that I think are very important. Uh, one is this idea of 5% of students or staff that have confirmed COVID cases within a 14-day period. If you think back to our dashboard, we have this cut score as being for green. And the state is telling us, no, if, if you go above 5%, you're shutting a school down. Now, granted, this applies to schools, and our dial dashboard applies to the whole uh, district. Uh, we're looking to have some more continuity between what they're recommending for schools and what we're, we're seeing on our own dial dashboard. The big thing that we're seeing is this last bullet point is uh, when a school cannot operate because you have so many students and staff that are absent. And that's typically as a result of quarantining, uh, or students being an isolated or positive test or a combination of all three. Um, we're, we're seeing that um, as a huge impact to our system. Um, anytime you have that many people absent, as uh, Interim Superintendent Wise just spoke to, you have to have subs to come in there. Um, and so if you run out of subs, then you're asking teachers to cover for one another, and it becomes a very large jigsaw puzzle in order for us to be able to provide service to kids. Um, this is the language. Uh, we have seen this uh, pretty much every time that I've had the opportunity to speak uh, regarding the difference between quarantine, isolated, and positive tests. Um, this is something that we use this language frequently, so I wanted to keep this within our slide deck. Um, I'm happy to report that this first iteration of our interactive dashboard is available on our website. Uh, you can go there by getting onto um, the website and searching for it, or there's a short URL at the top of this slide deck to give you an opportunity to look at it. Um, you can change the date range. You can also look at students versus staff and look at feeders. It reports out the, the positive test by day. It gives you a classification on a pie chart regarding the levels of those tests. And also it gives you totals um, running from whenever you have your date range. Um, this idea here is for us to be able to provide this information more transparently. Um, but a lot goes behind this data. Um, I mean, if you think about each one of these data points as hour, hours of staff time that goes into actually putting this together so that we're able to bring this forward for our, uh, our public. Um, a few things of note, um, there is a delay in the time that we're able to get this put together just because of the volume. Um, each case is several hours and it takes us time to be able to uh, do the contact tracing. At the bottom, we also include our weekly decision dashboard score. We do a snapshot every Friday of that dashboard score. 
Um, we've gotten you know, feedback on what day of the week we should do that, whether it's a Wednesday, a Tuesday, a Monday, or a Sunday. Um, we have landed on Friday, and, and to be consistent, we've just kept it on Friday. Um, so that was the score as of last Friday. As you can see, between Friday and today, we've gone from an eight to a six. Um, other data that we wanted to provide is substitute. Uh, when we go back to um, the slide that does talk about the operational needs and a school's inability to do that, that's largely based on our staffing. So we wanted to show just a snapshot of, uh, this is the week of the second, which is during uh, the election. Uh, this is just a, a daily count of all of the substitutes that are um, really being requested, all of the absences that we've got in our system uh, by the days of the week. And also you can see the ones that are reflected that are specifically COVID related. That's part of our questions that we ask, is this related to COVID or not? So you can see that broken down by each of the different levels. Um, the other piece that we're really interested in is not only how many folks are absent, but also what's our fill rate for substitutes in order to fill those vacancies um, in just in a daily vacancy rate. Uh, we love to have a 90% or higher. Uh, that's really our goal. Um, and in Douglas County, we have a great sub pool. And we're able to typically, in a typical year, keep that above 90%. Um, but it has been challenging. Uh, you can see on Monday, we had a fill rate of 77%. And what happens when you have a lower fill rate is you start asking for people internally to cover those classes. It becomes very, very challenging to cover classes internally when you have a large number. Um, as one of the speakers uh, talked about, public commenters talked about earlier, um, we're asking staff to cover um, not only their own students, but we're also asking them to cover for another teacher if we can't um, find subs to fill those positions. So another piece of data that we uh, are closely monitoring. Um, we do have some perspectives. Uh, we've had an opportunity to really uh, discuss this with our school leaders and, and have an opportunity really to brainstorm and, and quite frankly, just listen. Like, just tell us what we're hearing. Um, uh, this is a, a conversation that we've had not only with school leaders, but also with other staff. What are the themes that we're hearing from our staff regarding this movement and this current mode of operation. Um, really, the moving in and out, I, I think the desire for us is to maintain consistency. Uh, we all want to have schools in, or in session with all students all the time, um, and we're really pushing to have that. And so that causes us to move in and out because we have a quarantine, we have to move those folks out, we want them back in, and so we're constantly moving in and out. Um, another thing that's really a, a topic of conversation that you heard it several times tonight is that, that idea that people are spending many, many hours um, really trying to answer to the needs of the students and our staff. Um, and that's something that we're seeing from our school level staff, our nurses, our leaders, uh, where they're spending seven days a week helping us try to do things like contact tracing and quarantining. It's, um, and you guys all uh, received the emails as we are you know, constantly processing those things through, it does take a tremendous amount of time for us to do that. Um, and then there's the additional hours that you know, is required to respond to each one of these quarantines. So even if I, as a staff member, don't have an active quarantine, I have to respond to the students that are in front of me that may or may not be part of that quarantine. Um, and I did include some, some feedback themes, um, you know, stretching too thin, breaking point, hard to do well, those kinds of things that just show the stress um, the feedback that we're getting from staff at this point. Um, with that, I'm going to open it up for questions uh, regarding all things data. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. Directors, what questions do you have regarding the overview that Mr. Wise and Mr. Reynolds has presented to us? Um, any questions regarding the, the data sets that we've seen and some of the things that has been presented tonight? Questions? Director Long, go ahead. Thank you very much, you know, for uh, the overview. I would like to ask um, the substitute issues that you're talking about, that is not only limited to a school district, right? Because we are basically compete with every other single school district in the metro area for a very limited pool of people and it's not like there's magically, there's a huge number of people that we can find. Um, and it's not going to happen tomorrow, it's not going to happen next week. 
So, so first of all, I want to make sure that um, the substitute issues is not only limited to us, and that's not going to be getting any better anytime soon. That's, that's my question number one. Yep. Yeah. Chief Human Resource Officer, Amanda Thompson. And the microphone came. Good evening. I think your um, microphone, is it on, yes. Amanda? Yes. Well, can you hear me okay? Yep. So um, thank you for the opportunity to give a brief update on subs. So yes, um, I'm part of a um, larger group of HR directors across the state in terms of school districts, and everybody is experiencing difficulty in terms of um, finding subs. So whereas we are right now at one of our lowest points in terms of fill rates, such as 70%, um, I do see other districts and have heard that some are as low as 50%. They're not in close proximity to us, but everyone is struggling. Um, in fact, uh, some of our licensure resource um, individuals at Colorado Department of Education are partnering with all of the HR departments across the state in terms of brainstorming, sharing tips and tricks, and seeing what they can do to positively impact this as well. But yes, we have tried many strategies and are continuing to do so. We continue to hire on subs, and whereas we have um, over 500, 600 subs in our system, we have to keep in mind our subs are also getting quarantined right now. Um, we are providing training for our subs in terms of what remote looks like, what are safety precautions that they need to know, um, what are some other curricular resource and training that they need to be able to be prepared for to support kids. Uh, we also are um, aware that our subs get to choose locations, knowing that we're a very big district. And so uh, whereas we may have a sub over here at this school, they may not prefer to drive to this part of the district. They can choose days of the week, they can choose uh, preferences, and we're hearing a little bit here now that our subs are getting nervous as well. Not speaking for all subs, but we're hearing that information here and there. So please know that we'll continue to partner across the metro area in terms of strategies, but other districts have begun to adopt some of ours. Um, and again, we always want to grow and improve Improve, but we are seeing an increased difficulty. And I also would like to add, um, you know, Aurora is remote. Cherry Creek is remote. Yet today we had one of our highest sub needs and one of our lowest sub percent fills. So even when other districts are out, we have high schools that are out. And when you have high schools that are out, you free up a lot of subs to cover, cover other spots. That's the struggle we have daily. Um, and how we maintain that over time and we have other teachers covering classes, and so they don't have off periods, and we have this day after day after day, because the quarantine is 14 days. That's hard to maintain. Um, so when you talk about the work hours, the, the, the tipping points, the stress levels, um, those are all factoring in. We don't want to paint a, a picture that, that is despair, but we want to be clear with what is, what's really going on in the schools and what are we struggling with? What don't we see? And so sub rate is just one part of that, but then how we cover positions within our schools and have administrators cover. We've had two schools where security teams are knocked out. How do you have, how do you have quality schools when you're missing key people? So I think in all those cases, the, the impact of staff and teachers who are quarantined or are COVID positive and how we can recover from that, let alone the hours of work that it takes to trace and then also report out and send letters. I think those are the things that we have to be clear that we don't really know. You know, as, as community members, as parents and everything else, we can't see what happens to make this take place. We heard about letters going out at 10 o'clock at night. That's daily. That's all weekend. Um, so I think of those things of how we can be clear about why we're facing this. Districts like Littleton right next to us, trying to maintain as long as they can also, are feeling the same pressures and in very much a very similar spot to us. Jefferson County, very close to us. Same size, just a little bit larger than us, battling through that same process. So I just want you to know that we're not alone. We are competing. We raised prices. We raised uh, pay for, for subs, try to recruit more. Um, and we've done a great job to try to be creative. We're fighting. We're going to keep fighting. But in reality, we're at those points when we see that data straight up. And I'm going to point it out here in a second. When you see that data straight up over such a quick period of time, so many schools are filling this. And, uh, and, it's, and it's getting to that point of, uh, we want to be great. We want to do a great job by our kids. We want to be in school. We're really after reflective of, of data and impact 
can we? And what are those things that fall into that? So we want to be really clear of how, we, how we're really looking at it and measuring it to, to try to make it more understood. Um, and that'll be in the few slides to come also. Very good. good. Director Holtzman and then Director Hansen. Yeah. So the first question is just a really quick clarification. Um, on the dashboard that you showed tonight, I just wanted to clarify that it was current using, using the most current data that you had sometime today. I think the date on the presentation says 11-4, so just for the community and maybe if we could correct that um, as it gets posted so that they know that we're using the most current data that we had today. Um, and kind of going along with that, I'm not sure if you guys are probably aware, because I know, and you can confirm this, but I know that you continue to work closely on basically an hourly basis with Tri-County Health Department as you apply the guidance and the recommendations for isolation and quarantine. And just kind of as an aside, I know we had some public comment and questions about isolation and quarantine, and I wanted to thank you that every time you present, you have the definition up there, and that if you go on our website and look on our facts, it will show you exactly the guidance and recommendation that we're, we're going with in terms of what CDPHE and Tri-County tells us about those things. So I know there's still confusion, but it is on our website. And so I would, wanted to encourage people to look at that. Um, but as you guys have been working with Tri-County, I'm wondering if Dr. Douglas has expressed to you all um, what I noticed that he expressed in a letter um, with, along with a lot of other county health department directors and, and also in a statement to CPR today. Um, he said that even within Tri-County Health Department, and I, I don't wanna miss say what he said, so I'll look at it. Um, he said that COVID case volumes are so high that mitigation me measures, including contact tracing, don't work as well. They are simply too many people to contact about their contacts. We just can't keep up with all of this at that point, is what Dr. Douglas said. Um, and, and I hear you all saying that you're having similar situations within our schools. And, and knowing that Tri-County is having the same issue, is that further complicate things for us? Does that make it hard to know that, you know, as they're contact tracing the entire county, we also, we work with them closely. So um, I'm assuming that, that we're kind of adding to each other's workloads as we do this. Is that accurate or? Yeah, I think um, there's two pieces to it. And I, I think Nancy might be able to jump on me here with the, just a second here, but I, I do want to touch on one thing that uh, the schools are an interrelated component of our community. And so where we see the, the raise in you know, rates, or we see the rise in the positivity, or we see the rise in any one of these metrics, we're part of the community. Um, granted, we have safety mitigation strategies within our buildings, but we're also, you know, those kids are coming to us and they're with us for six to seven hours a day, but out in the community the rest of the day. And so there is a huge interrelation between the data that Tri-County Health is gravitating towards and gathering and, and using to their analysis, but also the, the data that we gather as well um, in terms of contact tracing. Um, it is challenging for us to do that work. Um, this is something that our nurses, and you know, another shout out to our nurses on just what they're able to do, uh, to be able to go through and do contact tracing as well as we can. Um, you know, we don't test every student. Uh, some students are asymptomatic. We get a positive test. We go through our standard checklist as provided by the health department to find out who these uh, children are. Um, I did hear the same exact thing from Dr. Douglas today, um, and that speaks to that spike in our, um, and, and the slope in our curve there, that it's, it's getting to the point where it's really difficult even for them as a health department to keep up. Thank you. I just, I appreciate you also um, acknowledging the connection between us as the largest employer and the provider of education for 94%, I think, of our K through 12 students or PK through 12 students, um, and how, how our work and Tri-County's work is so closely aligned at this point. I appreciate that. Great, thank you, Director Holtzman. And I know Director Hansen said she got her question answered through that, that response. Um, I do have a quick question, Mr. Reynolds. So you have um, on your data tracker, when it says positive cases, um, I, I know we heard from public commenters tonight about the confusion between my, you know, quarantining for a ch uh, being exposed to a child that is symptomatic versus being exposed to a child that has been um, confirmed positive. 
So your data tracker, though, doesn't track those students who we have isolated because of just symptomatic reasons as opposed to a positive case? Or are these all students that we've asked to leave the school or to be isolated or quarantined? So uh, I'm going to see if I can get back there. I don't know. Can you get the, the mouse to... Um, let me see if I can get back there. So you do see that we have um, not only uh, positive uh, cases, but we also have isolated and quarantined. So we're representing all three metrics there. Um, that those positive cases are the ones that we have confirmed. Okay. Um, the isolations are those that are, that are feeling ill with COVID-like symptoms, and then you have your quarantine. So we are capturing all of those um, to the best of our ability with our nursing staff. Very good. All right, thank you, directors. Other questions? Director Long, go ahead. If we can go back to uh, the, the sixth slide. The one that, that has a number uh, E is the trend in two weeks, incident rate youth age five to uh, 18. Mm -hmm. So um, in there, the box that we are circling for our county is actually 169%, right? And it's even higher than Avapro County and uh, Adams County. Um, so, so my question is, um, is the highest level that we have seen ever since we keep track of this? And also, you mentioned about the sharp rise of the curve. If we look at from October 4th onwards, the slope is really sharp. So is it safe to say that that is the trend that we worry about that we're not actually falling back down and is continuously going if we don't do any sort of um, fettering to curve in our county, we could easily go to orange very soon. I mean, I think it's very important that we you know, here for education, our children, our students are number one priority. But in order to educate a student, we need to make sure that we have enough staff to provide wonderful, consistent educations. And we also, we have to have a family member to support a student. And, and if that is the short wipe the curve, are we, if we don't take any actions right now, are we endanger the household where this student go into? And in a way, is also making our student less safe, you know, themselves and, and their family, they're supporting them. Thank you. Okay, there's a lot of questions there. Um, <laughs> and, and I'll try to get to a few of them. Um, I'll go back and look to see if that percentage is the highest we've been. Um, there may have been some times previously where we've had, where we've seen a small spike down here where that slope is, is really high. And so you've had a large jump at a, a specific spot. This represents a percentage, so there might be times earlier. I'll have to go back and look to see if I can identify one of those. Um, you are correct that we are concerned about this general trajectory for this particular one. Um, the, the dashboard, and I want to get back to there if I can get this thing to, to work with me here. Um, when you talk about the dial dashboard, the dial dashboard does not include the, the case data for ages 5 through 18. It's based on these metrics right here, but that case data for five through 18 is, is gonna impact it because it's part of the greater community. Um, the dial dashboard for caution metrics for schools helps us focus in on that because that's our clientele within our system. Um, but we are concerned that we will, if nothing changes and we continue on this path, that we will be orange. Um, and if we enter this level of orange, our ability to respond will be restricted based on what happens at this level? Um, and I mentioned earlier that that targeted quarantining, which is really what's keeping our high schools open at the moment, we lose that ability. So as you move from left to right, you get further and further and down this pathway, you get more and more restrictions uh, placed upon you by the health department. And so if we do move to this uh, level, we will have more restrictions, not just in our school, but in our greater community as well. And to add one other point, um, Matt said it well, November 4th is when we moved to yellow. So that was that change when it was added. Tri-County updates us every two weeks. 
So our spike is there. We very well could be in orange right now if you look at our data. They don't update that and change that until a week from tomorrow, the 18th. So we're operating in the notion that we're yellow. When you look at all the data, I would tell you that we're probably in orange. Okay, but we need to wait till the 18th with Tri-County before it becomes official because that's when they change that up. It's two weeks, so it's not live. Just like we update ours every Friday, but you gotta see our actual score tonight is a six. Friday was an eight. In three days, we're a six. We had 30 some cases over the weekend and another 30 new ones yesterday. That's the hard management to happen and that's that trend of upward data that's having that impact. And we start seeing that piece, Kevin, I think you also go back to, if you go back to, to here, you're gonna see it in a second. This goes back to September 6th. What was September 6th? Right around Labor Day. We knew Labor Day would probably push that up. It went up and then it started to come down. After fall break, we started seeing it come up. We wanted it to come down. Unfortunately, right now, it's going up sharper, quicker. We want to predict that it's going to plateau, go back down. But current state, our data keeps going up. So the impact right now in the moment is great. And where it will more than likely continue to go is continuing that impact, more cases. And I'm going to say this, I want people to be clear. Um, I do not want death rate to be the measure at all. In fact, we want that to stay low, but our impact of cases and, and impact of schools and ability to have school happen. If this Wednesday, if tomorrow was the date, what's our data telling us? And again, like Matt said, it's not just high schools, but middle schools and high schools, their target quarantine is helping because the amount of time it goes in where I walk into a classroom and I measure six feet, and if you're in that seat, six feet, you are quarantined. We'll be back to, if you're in that classroom, all of you are quarantined, and that's teacher. So how do we maintain that if and when we are in the orange level? I think that's a piece that we want to push of, of the clarity of impact that we have right now, and we're not in orange officially. But what if is going to happen? And, uh, and again, to maintain that, and we look at time and where we are, and a Thanksgiving week that we, we want to enjoy and families enjoy, um, but that continuing process of, if it continues to rise, um, where are we gonna be? And even current state right now, can we maintain? All right, Director Meek, you have a question. So thank you very much, this is really helpful. I think my questions really revolved around how do we work with our community to help alleviate that steep increase? And so, you know, board members are the linkage to the community, and I'd love to brainstorm, you know, is it town halls that include Tri-County Health to help explain to the community? I think people are frustrated because they're not living and breathing this like all of us, and they don't understand the implications between what we need to do when it goes to orange versus yellow, and so, I would like to just hear my peers thinking, you know, is it town halls? Is it outreach to the largest employers like Charles Schwab is the next largest employer besides the school district? You know, is it reaching out to them with a campaign asking their employees to help us, you know, um, educate around the need to make sure our kids are following the right protocols? Um, is it writing op-eds in the newspaper? I mean, what are the actions that we can be taking to try to help influence the community and its thinking and its understanding? So I don't know if maybe either of you have ideas or if my peers have ideas. So I truly, uh, I think town halls are great. I think the ability to answer questions um, influence, understanding. I don't want to ever, it's, it's not my job to try to influence behaviors. I think you try to influence understanding, you look at the data, and then people need to own their own behaviors. Now, I think by sharing more, making it clear, uh, looking at our data and being open to, to those questions um, allows us to have dialogue. So I think the town halls would be fantastic. 
I think that partner of town holds with Tri-County, uh, myself and others, um, and the community would be great. Because I do think there's a lot of misinformation, misunderstanding. I think understanding pain, really saying what is happening, what are those tipping points. The health data is a part of it. But remember, it's, it's just a part of it. The school impact, a part of it. The substitute impact, going in and out. Um, we had schools on the first day back from fall break have to go into to, to quarantine in classes. So I think that going back and forth is an impact. I also understand going to full remote is tough. It's probably tough for all, but it's also tough for some more than others. And we're aware of that. That's not where we want to be, but reality, I think how we create that understanding and share more and be able to answer questions is needed. And you hear that in the dialogue of the, of the public comments. Uh, so the more I think we can do that and create some town halls and partner up would be fantastic. For directors and, and Director Meek, we might be get, we might get back to you more of your question for discussion um, later. But are there other questions regarding the the data? And um, I do. I guess I, I do have one. One of our commenters asked, "Why don't we require students that are quarantined to get tested?" So that's that, that's one question I have. And then question two is, how many times do we see a student that's been quarantined come back? and all of a sudden be sick, or we find out that the students that are being quarantined are sick. Do we have any kind of inclination about that? So should we be requiring students to get tested when they're quarantined? And then two, do we have any evidence that when students are quarantined that they get sick? Yeah, and, and Nancy can probably answer this better than I can, but even if you're on quarantine and you get tested, working with Tri-County, you still have to go through those 14 days because that range of when you might show symptoms and also test positive could, di be, could differ. So if you do too soon or later in that time period, that's why the 14 day quarantine is in place because it's a number of days. Um, we are seeing minimal cases where when you're quarantined, you're coming back positive because of that case. We're seeing minimal student to student, student to teacher, teacher to student. We're seeing a lot of, it's, we're being exposed or testing positive from the community and that's coming into our school and having an impact on the ability to have school. But we're also seeing more, with more cases going up. And what Director Holtzman talked about, Tri-County's stressed. You look at the cases going up everywhere and they are spending more time with those, with those areas that even have a, a, a greater number. All of our curves are straight up, but the ability in which to contract trace well and really go back to say confidently, is it passing through student to student? is decreasing. That ability to do that well um, with partnering with Tri-County and ourselves is, is becoming an impact. So early on the data, I think we had clearer pieces of that, uh, Director Ray, but I think now it's, uh, as those cases increase, where's our confidence level? And Nancy, I don't know if you want to share a little bit more of that, I, if I cover that well for you or if, uh, if there's more you'd like to share. No, thank you so much. If, uh, if a student has been identified as being exposed to somebody who's positive, they are required to quarantine for 14 days, which is based on the incubation period of the virus. Parents are encouraged to have their students tested if the students develop any symptoms during that 14 day period. Also, if students um, are not necessarily part of a quarantine, but they are absent because of any type of symptoms. They get very clear direction from our schools about what symptoms and how long, and then they are recommended to, to have a test. And so we can't necessarily require parents to um, test their kids, but they are very much encouraged to do so at very um, key times. And if a student is quarantined for the full 14 day period and they've never developed symptoms, we're following the state guidance to say that they can return to school. Um, the chances are that they did not contract um, the virus based on that exposure. And Mr. Wise is correct. The vast majority of positive cases that we are seeing among students and staff have to do with exposures outside of school, whether um, in their family, there are um, increased cases where uh, households are all, um, contracting the virus and um, other activities and situations that people experience outside of school. All right, thank you, Ms. Ingalls. Director Chancho Shore, you have a question? Um, thank you, Director Ray. Uh, Ms. Ingalls, I think you answered my question because my question is specifically, um, 
and I think you answered this, but let me make sure. Uh, there is there evidence or is there no evidence that this COVID is being transmitted at school? Uh, Mr. Wise mentioned this. There are some cases where two positive people have been identified from the same classroom or the same group. So that could indicate a spread within that classroom or group. Um, that number is, I don't have that number um, available to me right now, but that number is very, very small relative to our total number of positive cases. Thank you. And I'd say that's probably common among several school districts. Um, we've been tracking it with the um, Denver Area Superintendent Council and looking at that data but more and more of our school districts were not able to say that there hasn't been a transfer uh, within our schools. Majority are from the outside coming in, but when we look at the increase of numbers and then the, uh, the positive cases where they are together or closer together in that piece, um, we're not able to say that there's not. But I will say when we talk about changing behaviors, we do need help. Um, some of the big get-togethers, just like we see with college campuses, high school socialization. Um, you know, I, I wish we had homecoming also, but homecoming this year uh, with COVID, unfortunately, uh, can't happen. But some of those big get-togethers, I need to ask to say, if we want to be in school, we need to we need to do our part and help. And I get we want to be normal. I want to be normal. I want my daughter to have a normal experience too. But we've got to change some of those behaviors. We gotta we gotta pitch in and be aware and balance that piece, and it's tough, and I don't want to lecture or everything else, but, but yeah, we are seeing that impact coming into our schools, uh, and unfortunately now we see that trend throughout uh, the metro area, and, and I don't know if it's gonna be able to plateau anytime soon, so it's a, it's a, it's a reality. So um, that balance, that how we work together, and, and understanding that impact. So I'm gonna let Director Hansen has a question and then directors, I'm gonna suggest we take a break because I know uh, Mr. Weiss, part B of this presentation is to get into, so what? <laughs> what do we do now? Um, but go ahead, Director Hansen, your question, please. Thank you. I actually just wanted to comment on what Mrs. Ingalls and Director Chonchu Shore just mentioned. Um, I think it is really important to acknowledge that our numbers of transmission within classrooms is relatively low. And I believe that is because we are following such extensive quarantine and isolation protocols as we are required to do. And I think sometimes our community members are using that to share with us that um, everything's everything is fine and we should go back to normal because there are no um, students that are becoming ill, students or teachers who are becoming ill within the four walls of our school buildings. And um, I just actually think that is a really important distinction that we need to be sure we are clear on that, um, that there is absolutely the possibility that um, our numbers of student to student or student to teacher um, exposure would be significantly higher if we didn't have the quarantine protocols in place that we're currently using. Very good, thank you for that, Director Hansen. So directors, let's take about a five minute break and then we'll come back and we'll talk about next steps. Thank you, Mr. Wise, Mr. Reynolds, Ms. Ingalls.
recommend that we look at uh, delaying our Board of Education goal emphases, the interpretation of the board goal emphasis, and the gifted and education review um, to uh, December, one of our December uh, meetings. So if you concur, if you would just, I think we need to make a motion to modify our agenda to delay those three items to a meeting specific in December. Is there um, a willingness and or a motion to do that? Um, I'd be happy to make a motion to um, postpone the academic goal emphasis um, item, and I'm sorry, I don't have it right in front of me to read it, and also the gifted and talented presentation until a future meeting. And add, so, add to your that third item, uh, Director Holtzman, the Board of Education goal emphases as well as the academic excellence okay. interpretation. So there's three yes. items, items 20, 21, and 22. Motion's been made to delay that to December. Is there a second? A second. Second by Lung. Any further discussion? Okay, so the motion is to modify the agenda. Let's vote real quick. Chancho Shore. Aye. Graziano. Aye. Hansen. Aye. Holtzman. Aye. Lung. Aye. Meek. Aye. Ray. Aye. So that modification passes unanimously. All right, so we're back to, um, again, Mr. Weiss, we are ready to move on and talk about, so what are our next steps? Given the data that we have heard tonight, um, what are the things that we're thinking about as we move uh, towards next steps for our students. All right, so, you know, reality is we try to paint the picture a little bit and be clear. I don't want to be in this spot. I know you don't want to be in this spot. The past uh, several days have been tough. As we talk with level principals, we talk about um, our ability to, to maintain and continue our work to get through Thanksgiving, let alone past, has been our goal, and to look at individual schools. I mean, truly our goal is to say some schools might not be impacted. Let's try to keep those open and push out the others. The reality is when you look at our data and you look at this spike, this is hard. And I pointed it out earlier, but I want you to know the time that we look at between September 9th and October 18th, elementary data only. We had 11 positive cases of staff members between September 9th and October 18th. We had 30 student positive cases. Between October 18th and today, November 10th, we had 30 cases of students positive. And we had 54 positive staff. So let's go back to that. Students, September 9th through October 8th, 18th, 11 cases. October 18th through now, 30 plus cases. So just in that short time frame, that spike is real. Unfortunately, these are positive COVID cases, not just quarantines. The quarantine cases are even greater. Now, targeted quarantine has helped. But the number of cases in so many of our schools and the impact of that is leading to the ability uh, or the, the unability uh, are un uh, not being able uh, to have, uh, have school, to have it open. We're pushing out, classes are pushing out, schools, and our tipping points of exhaustion, uh, it's real. And so, you know, I don't want to go back over those, those groups that are working, but when you look at that data, um, so when we talk about staff, you can't have school without teachers. September 9th through October 18th, we had 30 positive cases of staff. From October 18th to today, 54 positive cases, okay? And that doesn't sound a like a lot, but again, when you, have, when you have so many schools and then you have quarantine around those teachers and this is only at the elementary level. So remember, for every staff, that entire class is out. Because at the elementary level, you don't have targeted. So every teacher, the entire class is out. Those are the things I want you to understand, the amount of hours then in which to trace, to go back and pull rosters, to then commu create communications, and then if you have another case the next day, you do it all over again. And you look at the impact of quarantining and how we maintain those things in schools and then the discipline of all those classrooms and schools at night. Those are the things that we don't necessarily see that our staff and our special ops teams, and thank you to all the nurses, um, that you only have so many nurses to do this they don't get to eat dinner with their families. They don't get to 
have weekends. They are, they are doing COVID tracking all the time. So in reality, I just want you to know and see that. Um, and when we look at those things, that threshold, we're over the 350 mark. When we start talking about our, our, the color coding system of yellow to orange, that's having an impact. And coming back, when we say after October 18th, that is when we came back in person, at the elementary level, full in person. That's not the only reason for it. There's a lot of variables. We had fall break. We were full in person. These are only elementary numbers that I shared with you on that detail. Um, but we actually have more elementary teachers that have tested positive for COVID than we do secondary. So when we say the elementary level doesn't get COVID, isn't impacted by COVID, or it isn't as much, unfortunately, our data is telling us a little bit different story, and we don't want it to. We want our youngest learners in school. More than anything, especially look at the, the K2, K3, but the impact even at the elementary level, um, it's happening. And unfortunately, it's growing. And I want to ask everybody for help. But even then, I don't know if we can stop it or even slow it down enough to, to, to get through. The other thing I want you to know as we start looking at um, the process, um, you look at the state order. So who impacts this? Well, CDPHE is the one who works with Tri-County to set our two-week date. So we're waiting to the 18th to find out if we're in orange. We look at the data, and we can tell what it, what it says. When we look at the, the changes and the significant changes from the 18th, and then we start to go into, when you look at that metric, we're a six. But we're a six with a cut line of 5%. That probably isn't an accurate cut line we should be using. So my recommendation is really to be more realistic. And you look at number of kids impacting to then at our tipping points, and this is what I'd recommend of, of positive cases with staff or students to start making decisions. So really to get our dashboard more accurate. And I'd say as a six with 5%, we'd probably be closer to a five, maybe even a, you know, a four on that side. And that's our reality right now that I just need everyone, teachers, public, to understand that we're at that tipping point, um, both for safety and health, but also for ability to maintain and, and provide and keep schools open. And even if you keep some, the amount of work is going to be tough because uh, in a matter of a day or a week, those schools could be impacted. And we've seen it. We've had principals say, I'm great one day, and literally in a day or two later, the tipping points get so great that we have to shut down um, a school. So when we look at school closures, when we put this together for you, we were at eight. We're actually now at 10. Uh, I missed one earlier in saying that. So when I said nine and four high schools, we also have Plum Creek Academy uh, that is, that is uh, remote. So we actually have 10. When we look at our substitute teacher rate, that's a factor we have to measure. If we cannot fill positions and have teachers in the classroom, we can't cover for everyone all the time, especially for 14 days. It's one thing to ask teachers to cover for others for a day or two. To maintain that every day for the amount of time we have is, is exhausting. And even the ability to do that well when you have someone else in your classroom, can they teach and cover the same stuff as well? Is it a quality education? I know there's going to be struggles no matter what mode we're in, but is that really quality? Today it was our lowest rate, 72%. We had the need of 273 substitutes. We're paying $200 for a substitute today. We filled 196, 77 unfilled. Just an example of the data of why, what that means and what it looks like in our system. Um, when we look at our learning models, you know, these are our two choices. We've been working hard to look at each individual school. We really wanted to keep that going even into this week. Going into Monday morning, working with cabinet, working with our team, really wanted to say, can we keep going to individual schools and push out schools at a time, even if it's a level. If we push out all of high schools, would that help us with our nursing staff? But those nurses still have to work, so we could have a couple come down and help at the lower levels. But we still have the number of quarantine pieces coming in. Thunder Ridge High School daily has quarantines that we're still sending letters out to and positive cases of staff and students, as an example. So when we look at that impact of, of can we maintain and do the, the current spot of working with individual schools. Unfortunately, right now, I don't believe we can. I think the numbers are going up and the impact is so great and the ability to, to, to provide and do the actual data tracking work, let alone to have schools open, 
Um, unfortunately, I, I don't feel like we're at that point. I also look at timing of it. I want you to know as we start looking at these possible recommendations of decision making, this is the data we'll use to, to make a decision as a school district that I, with our team and our schools and our people, will look at, will continue to look at, and then have to make some hard decisions. But as you look at this piece, those school personnel and those people that we have to depend upon are a small group, a specialty group at times. And we can't replace some of those specialty groups if they get to the point of can't do this anymore. If we lose nurses, how are we gonna do this? When we look at the bottom part, um, if we move to remote after Thanksgiving, we have three weeks. We want to work to commit that we'll be back January 4th as a teacher workday as planned, January 5th with students. We want to continue to work on our data to measure that as we move closer to that date, we'll continue to look at our data, just like we are now, because we have better metrics. When we created some of these metrics in August coming back into school, we didn't understand COVID. We didn't understand COVID's impact on our system. When you look at our metrics compared to other school districts, you're gonna see some similarities. We're sharing information, we're working together, we're trying to figure out how do we do this together. Um, so we're not standing alone with those metrics. But we're learning, we're learning as we go and we're getting better. And unfortunately our data is just rising too quickly and it's showing us our need and it's humbling us. But it's also temporary three weeks. So when we look at this on, on, on the piece, to really move out at any time, we probably need about five days. So if we're gonna move as a system to go from, from where we are right now to remote, current state, I think we need about five days. So as we start looking at data and moving forward, um, you look at reality of, of process. We wanna keep base open, but how do we work within that to make sure they're ready? And how do we increase opportunities uh, for daycare? Because we, we, we do know that's gonna be an impact. I can empathize with parents and families that we're gonna have to help on that side. Um, when we look at how we make that change and, and preparation with families, so when I get those emails and saying, if we're gonna do this, give us enough time, we've gotta make adjustments. It's not just for our schools that we need time, it's also for our families that we need time. So that's where we're recommending at least a week of preparation and notification, hence why we're sending out communications to say prepare for this. Help us in your changes, but also prepare for this, be ready. Um, when you look at timing right now, that puts us really at that Thanksgiving break. With a break for a week where you could be traveling around others, I don't have confidence that we're gonna see a plateau and it's gonna come down. And even as the numbers, if they stay current, they're still at that high level where we're gonna see changes in our ability to even um, do targeted quarantining. So when you look at this, I think those are the, the things that I want you to understand. And, and as we have that as a piece, um, that as your interim superintendent to take the responsibility of evaluating all of it, I wish we were in this spot. I wish we were in this spot for a number of things, but we need, to, we need to be decisive and purposeful. We need to be intentional about if we do roll out, what's that gonna look like? Have strong details of our planning of each level for each student. We're gonna have a heightened awareness of mental health. No matter where we are, how do we connect with kids, engage with kids, check on kids, families? How do we continue to have engagement academically, both synchronous and different ways in which we're getting kids involved? We're learning, we have a high level of learning. We're gonna have to do our best. This is not the spring, we're gonna be better. We've tried it, we've worked on it, we've had hybrid. It's not perfect. It's not where I wanna be. But as you can tell where we look at this, uh, um, that's what I'd like to share with you, with our staff and with our community of, of current state and the reality and the humbleness of we are, we're fighting hard, but this isn't where we wanna be. And, and honestly, it's not, it's not perfect. But I think that's the best recommendation and using the data and the metrics to paint a clear picture and also show the impact uh, that's happening that we don't always see. What questions do you have for me? Thank you, Mr. Weiss. Um, quick question I have is, uh, for the elementary, have we completely ruled out hybrid as being a possible pivot as opposed to going directly to remote? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we even looked at total nurses 
um, who do we have of nurses to be able to do the work? We have 45 total nurses in our school district. Two of them are at district level who coordinate everything. Um, we have 19 secondary nurses. So we have 15 in our elementaries. So in reality, what that means is we don't have nurses in every school. We have nurses that are splitting schools. Hence, the exhaustion level. So even if you looked at moving some of the nurses, because some will have to stay and do that, that COVID work regardless of a level and you try to move that down. Reality of can you keep schools open or a level open with tipping points and rise of rates. And I wanted to show you the elementary data because that's one of our biggest questions that we had. I think in reality, our, our decision is probably for these three weeks to look at PK-12. Um, base has worked hard and they want to stay open. We're working with that model in our decision-making process. Uh, we want to build in times for intervention, times for one-on-one -on -one and work on that. But when we look at even the ability to, to do levels and the amount of elementaries and the numbers of elementary uh, positives going up, that's going to be hard to do. But we have, we're examining it. We're still examining it. But current state, if I had to give you the recommendation based off of where we are, that's going to be very hard to do. But that's why we're, we're not making the decision to do that tonight. We're giving you our decision-making process and impact. And, uh, but that's, that's the answer I would. I feel I need to give you. So hybrid, we don't think that will reduce the positivity rate because you're, you're, so what you're saying is you still need the same resources to respond to the quarantining, the contract tracing in a hybrid model as you would in our current in-person five days a week model. Yeah, so even when you look at the hybrid model, when with, with positive cases coming in our schools and quarantining and the ability then to even um, if a teacher goes out and you look at the number of teacher cases that we have at the elementary level and a teacher is out, then how do you provide that hybrid level of instruction? And it's a bit remote as it is. So even in that model, where's the consistency? Um, there's no perfect way, but pushing in and out and having that flip-flop effect, uh, that's not great either in the hybrid piece. And you look at the number of elementary teachers, um, just as a focus, that that's going to create Problems also. There's there's not a win-win. I wish there was a good solution. There's not a good solution on that. Thanks. Good question. Director Long. Well, I, I want to commend you know your decisiveness, and as you said, there's nothing. There's no set formula to do this, and but you know you're willing to take a stand and do what's the good for the school district. And for that, I I want to thank you, you know, for what you do. Um, and a while ago, we talked about you know, you know, the teacher, substitute teachers, um, and you mentioned about the nurse. And I want to ask our COO um, to comment a little bit about um, the operations to maintain our school to open. I heard that our staff actually go way beyond and above. They work until 2 a.m. to clean the school. A bus driver, I mean, which has been working so well with the committee to make sure that a bus driver cover as many routes as possible, even with a huge budget cut. And I want to listen to him to see how can his staff supporting the current environment. I heard that many of them are really exhausted and reached the breaking point. But I just want to hear from him to come in. I know that any of them will do as much as they could to make things happen, but at what cost? So could you tell us a little bit about you know how your team is doing in the, in the infrastructure side? Director Long, thank you very much for the question. Uh, first, I do want to acknowledge it's a complete teamwork. From the teacher's flexibility as uh, interim director uh, uh, and you know, Superintendent Wise said, with the nurses and directors of schools, the hundreds of texts all weekend into the wee hours in order to do contract tracing. As far as operations and maintenance, um, we are blessed. We have uh, special teams working on a shift uh, that's a, uh, a, an evening shift, a swing shift. They were gracious enough to accept that task once we went into coronavirus. Uh, and so they work from 3.30 to 11 every night. And we have lost uh, some very highly qualified personnel because of that that lifestyle and that task and that impact on their family and the balance. And what we're doing, we've been training and reaching out to our 
secondary uh, custodial staff at the middle and elementary schools to take on that, and they have. And we have been able to contact entire schools and rooms every evening. Uh, case in point, uh, they finished their shift at and we had, as uh, Interim Superintendent Wise said, uh, 30 schools. And while they are at tipping points and at their wits end, we will do everything possible. We always have, we'll continue, but they are at their tipping point. As far as bus drivers, they are also quarantined. And we've had significant impacts on the transportation staff. And we continue to meet routes. But the challenge is uh, there are students one day and then the next day there are no students or fewer students on those buses because they're quarantined. So the bus drivers will drive their routes. They're flexible to uh, explore other opportunities as the district pivots uh, to other learning models. And uh, we are currently researching those options. So they will step up and work in whatever task is needed. And we're still having that dialogue to see what that will look like. And we need to discuss that uh, in depth with transportation, but uh, we will be ready when we pivot. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Cosgrove. Director Chancho Shore, you have a question. Yes, and it really is kind of a piggyback. It was interesting how this piggybacks, and I'm gonna try to soft pitch it because it's going to be really unpopular um, to say it out loud. However, we are going to go, if we decide that we're going to go remote, um, we have many people, many personnel, many employees that then don't have the same responsibilities. Um, I'm sure that our teachers will still be accountable to meeting the needs of the kids five days a week. I'm sure that our principals will be checking in in Canvas and, and having accountability with their teachers, so ensuring that um, we're meeting the needs of our students. How will we assure fiscal responsibility for our other employees who will not have those responsibilities if we go remote? So that's a very good question. Um, each employee and each employee group is probably a different answer. Um, Rich has done a great job to talk about bus drivers who would be willing to help jump in and do a number of different roles within our district. We've talked about other classified and, and uh, admin pro tech and other roles uh, which could cross train and, and do other help. We've talked with principals and they've shared different ways in which we can build in more classroom support and student support. Uh, we can do more mental health check-ins. So we, we want to continue to build in quality work and build that in. The other reality I want to, to share, if we were to not pay bus drivers and they go get another job and we plan to open in January with people and we don't have bus drivers, how do we have school? So in the reality of a temporary process for three weeks, we need to maintain and get through. So we can't afford to always look at the bottom line and lose employees that you can't hire back because then you cannot provide the tools in which to have school. And each employee group is probably a little bit different that way, but we've been starting to break that down and plan for each of those and work on, um, again, as we look at this decision to move out to remote, um, we look at it as, as the possibility of Thanksgiving through winter break. We look as the plan and our priority will be back January 4th uh, with teachers as, our, as it is normal at workday and January 5th with students. We will have to reevaluate our, all of our data at that point. This whole year is going to be a roller coaster year where we'll be evaluating data. But we have mechanisms in which to give education, whether it be remote, whether we come back hybrid, whether we come back full in person. We'll be working on all three of those models where we can shift and adapt. We're hearing things about vaccines, and let's hope, you know what, knock on wood. Let's hope those vaccines come and can have an impact and start bringing back some normalcy. But no matter what happens and influences that, we've got to make sure we can provide an education. So in that planning, uh, Director Chancho Shore, uh, we also know we need to maintain who we have to provide education now and in January. Go ahead, Director Chancho Shore, follow up. Um, please don't misunderstand or misrepresent. I am not suggesting that we don't maintain okay. our employees. I am suggesting that we have specific plans 
for what we can be able to do. Um, you know, we're, we've been talking so much about what we are not able to do at this point. And I want to shift the conversation to what we can do now that if we make a decision to go remote, what wonderful things can happen with all of the extra people that are in our schools and in our system in this three weeks time, um, what can occur? That, that's what I'm shifting the conversation to. So please don't misrepresent or misunderstand that I'm saying we don't keep our employees. I'm saying what other things can we look at to assure that we have the most incredible situations available to our community? Yeah, and I think that's where that cross-training, um, the opportunities which can cross-train. In this pause, we need to also look at how can we hire more special ops? How can we hire more to support communications? So in that cross-training opportunity um, to expand on and do more, how do we get, uh, we've had schools had to send out letters. So how do we get that cross-training within schools and school employees? Um, that can help us come January uh, within that same model because we can build capacity in others and get that piece, um, we can do it too. So we need to look at how we can hire in our areas that we are, we are fixed and that's like school nurses and a specialty piece. How can we find and maybe get more people or how can we find more people that can help us with the uh, data tracking and some of that work? So I think that's a piece of cross training and using our people and taking the time to do that well. Uh, let alone to do the work while we're remote uh, to support our schools and support our kids. Because we do know that we have quality people in positions that that have multi-talents. So how yeah. I, I'm really just wanting to um, reiterate, how can we make this the best scenario in every situation for our community? Great point. Great point. And, and uh, yeah, we'll as I already started to share some of those things which we have in our points of, uh, of stress. And then we'll also look outside of the box how we continue to build uh, great people with more responsibility and different responsibilities. Absolutely. So we'll take task to that. Director Holtzman and then Director Long. Yeah, so um, I guess as we think about, you know, our students and how disruptive the quarantines have been described, um, and, and I know from my own inbox how many are happening every day. So, um, and also hearing that you've talked to our, our building leaders and, and teachers and they've expressed that the lack of consistency and stability is not, not good for our kids. Um, and understanding that when our teachers and our building leaders are consumed with just managing quarantines, at some point instruction is, is likely to be affected. As hard as I know that our leaders and our teachers <clears throat> are working to make sure that doesn't happen, um, the volume is just what, what I'm seeing is, is very great. But considering all of that, um, if we were to decide to go remote, there are students that are likely impacted more than others. For instance, our special education students, our English language learners, um, you know, I could, I could go on and on. Younger students, preschool through maybe grade two. And have we considered, considered those groups, our gifted and talented who are like in discovery programs, have we considered those and are there ways that we would be able to accommodate them with um, the in-person that, that all of our kids need, but that they may need even more? And, and how, how are we thinking about that? Yeah, and, and I don't know if Nancy's still available to talk, but. Um... You know, Nancy and her, and her department have talked about how we can build in uh, interventions, how we can look at prioritizing uh, who needs extra support and ways in which we build that in in person, uh, remote, and build in some interventions, one-on-one -on -one time, and extra work. That's true with our younger learners on top of our, our uh, at-risk students, students with uh, disabilities or IEPs, and, and how we work with the, the advanced and GT students also. So um, each of our directors in those areas are working with their teachers and their schools and developing plans in which to support that. Um, we have continued to do that throughout this year. As even in the hybrid model, it's a different medium which you teach. So how we support that with our teachers and continue to do a better job and continue that forward. Uh, we are identifying that. As I said to you, nobody wants to go out remote. I mean, we have teachers that want to stay. We have schools that want to stay. 
but the ability to do this well and systemically in that impact, um, how do we then provide the support to the students? And that's going to be our, our work ahead as an entire district to do that and identify ways and strategies. Director Long, go ahead. Well, there's a couple questions related to the students' health. Um, every board meeting you probably hear me mention about mental health. So if we go uh, all remote after Thanksgiving, how are we going to um, make sure that we provide additional support uh, for them? And the second question is, in the beginning of um, when the student making comment, they are suggesting because of the extra circumstances that we have, are we considering in some circumstances, in some subjects, we just have a pass and fail grade or uh, lower um, the point a little bit so that A in some 90% go, go to 85% and, and so forth. Um, so have we considered some of this also? Yeah, so, you know, just like with anything, I've, I've received emails to, from students that feel a need to go remote. I've received emails from students that want to stay in person that would struggle with remote. Same is true with parents. Um, there's gonna be struggles and different struggles and wants from each individual and, and that's in each school, let alone throughout our district. We will have a greater emphasis on mental health. Uh, we have already started to work on planning of what's that, what are those routines? What's that look like weekly, daily? Uh, what are our check-ins? How do we use more of our staff uh, to continue to do that and, and to build those connections and check in uh, to make that a priority? The other side is, as we look at grading, um, you know, when you look at grades, it's about learning. And sometimes we focus too much on the grades. The reality is you're talking about a high school level with rigor and GPA, and, and that's really where the grades are truly at that point of, of a scale. I take pride in listening to the high school principals that they have tried to build surveys with their staff, surveys with their kids, find out what's working, what's not working, where are the struggles, and work on adjusting that. Uh, as we continue to build that into the end of the semester, you know, I, I don't want to discount that we're going remote for any amount of time, but I also want to say we have three weeks remaining. Uh, so that impact of how we adjust with kids, help kids. Um, I know our teachers do that. I know our schools are prior, trying to prioritize that and get with, connect with kids to, to help them achieve where they want to achieve. Um, so I just want you to know that I think our schools have done a great job in building that survey, looking at their PLC time to adjust, to help, and to be ready for the end of the semester. And we are, we're nearing that end of the semester. Uh, we have two weeks in kind of finals in each of our high schools. And so when you look at that instructional and, and grading impact and how we help kids prepare for that into the year, into the semester, um, I know they've been working on that. They've done a nice job in, in creating those surveys and, and trying to reach out and really connect that. Director Chantra Shore has another question. Director Chantra Shore. Yes, thank you. Um, I am, I am again soft pitching. Uh, difficult scenario, difficult question. So, could we consider, and is there a way for us to take advantage of this? If we are to go remote and have a three-week remote opportunity, is there a way for us to look at things through a different lens, with different eyes, to? to address the areas of need and concerns that we have heard throughout the beginning of this year, specifically with our special populations. Um, if we are able to start having conversations about available professional development or ways to certify substitutes with our um, community of excellent employees that are classified employees or any of those kinds of ideas, um, I know it's been all consuming to take care of COVID um, in schools. And sometimes when those kinds of things happen, we don't have the opportunity to think outside of the box and start readjusting our thinking to what are some other opportunities. And we have heard that we have some specific areas of need and some specific areas of concern. And should we have an opportunity like moving to remote, we also have a bank of people that can help us in these areas of need and concern. So I'm, I'm soft pitching some questions that are saying, 
let's prepare our community with some, some so what? So what are we gonna do that is a little bit different maybe than than only offering remote if we go in that direction. We're offering remote and we also have XYZ new opportunities for our, for our special populations in our areas of needs and concern. Yep. I'm gonna let Nancy jump in. She and her team and others have been doing a lot of prep work on this as, as we've been uh, going. So, Nancy. Yes, thank you. So um, we'll be talking with the principals on Thursday on uh, ways to work with our buildings to help them identify those students who experience the most significant barriers um, to accessing their instruction online and determine how they could provide some in-person um, opportunities for intervention or specialized instruction for those particular groups. Also, our counselors and mental health providers may want to do some in-person um, groups with students or um, some engagement with them in person as well. Our counselors, social workers, and psychologists, well, as well as our mental health leadership team have done a lot of work since the summer preparing for um, the possibility that we could be full remote. They've done a lot of reflection on how it went last spring and um, they've really um, engaged in some very specific professional development and exchanging of um, practices and ideas about ways to better engage students remotely. So they are um, ready to go and eager uh, to um, engage fully with students remotely, as well as the possibility of bringing specific groups of students in. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Zingles. I have a question that kind of goes back to this notion of systemic versus individual schools. And I, I certainly understand uh, the rationale by doing PK through 12 and, and being a system. We have though schools and communities who um, maybe are anomalies, I, maybe, that are saying to us, hey, I haven't had quarantine. I, I, I have 80% or more better of my staff who are very confident that they can sustain in-person learning. Uh, we don't have a substitute teacher issue at our school. Um, so, so I guess my question is if, if this does become a systemic decision. Is, is there a place for waivers where a school can say, you know what, we think we can continue to sustain in-person learning. Our community is working hard at making sure that the disease doesn't get transmitted. Um, you know, we see a lot of times it's our schools that are smaller, you know, that those communities can have a little bit more control in terms of how they make sure the students aren't uh, transmitting the disease or they're not socializing in such a way that's causing for that community for the the metrics to increase so so I'm just wondering about those those schools those schools that don't have these issues that you've described tonight is there any is there any room for them to be able to say hey we, we've got this let us let us do this because we think we can sustain it and we don't have the issues that the district is describing so I think that's a great question, along with Director Chancho Shores and saying we need to take this back and work with our schools and work in our decision-making practice uh, to see what is available. So I think that's, uh, as you look at those uh, possibilities, thinking outside of the box, uh, how we've continued to try to do that all fall and into the past several weeks in particular, because we look at those numbers and the impact the past couple of weeks, how we do that, we'll continue to to ask those questions, brainstorm those ideas, uh, put ideas in place as we make this decision. Very good, thank you. Directors, other comments or questions? Uh, Director Graziano, I know you have a comment. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, um, I, I just wanted to comment, um, um, you know, as, as I listened to the presentation tonight and, and all the, the follow-up, I guess my initial take as I reviewed the, the presentation and everything and listened is really, it, it just struck me as lacking a lot of consideration for our kids, uh, consideration for men, mental health. I know we've mentioned it briefly here at the end, the isolation that remote learning brings, you know, with the online, we heard that from the very outset uh, from, from Emma, um, the falling behind, the course loads, the standards that aren't being met, 
the fact that for many students, school is a safe place. Um, you know, and just the overriding feeling that we keep saying, you know, kids need school. Um, and, and we also need to recognize that parents also need to work. And so, you know, this puts an undue onus on them. Uh, we're making it hard for them. I, I guess, I, so I guess what I'm saying is I, I feel like what we're positioning just seems like good enough. And I don't, I, I want to believe that after we get through a period of good enough, there is something that we're pushing towards. And I just feel like someone, it was one of the emails that we received and I thought, you know, it's a pretty timely word. It, the word that was shared with us was satisficing. Um, so I, I just kind of feel like I'm a, a, a little disappointed in the fact that uh, it's a it's a rough time and, and we're trying to pivot. But I also feel like the messaging really kind of left out a lot of what needed to be addressed around putting our students first. And, I, you know, I, I'm not hearing that. I'm not hearing any flexibility to keep schools open and things like that, that we could consider. So, um, you know, that's that's my comment um, on, on where we are right now. Thanks, Director Graziano. Um, directors, other other thoughts? And and I would I would just respond to Director Graziano also that um, I, I I really have felt some similar pangs that you've shared tonight. I think what really resonates for me is that we're it's 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 two dimensional. You know, we have these spikes that we're talking about and we have all this controversy around COVID in terms of what is positive, what is not, what's quarantine, who should be quarantined, who should be positive. We've got all that flurry going on, but then we've got what Mr. Wise described, a staff that is exhausted, a staff that is stretched thin. We have employees that are at their breaking point and, and I come back to that because even in the best circumstances, if we don't have employees that can feel like they can be present, that they can be safe, um, that they can do the job in the model that we have for them to do it, that has to speak equally as loud as our data and our metrics. And I hope our community heard that tonight because I, I think um, as Director Holtzman said, um, Mr. Wise, we, we rely on you to capture the pulse. And I think you did that well tonight. I think you really showed us that this is more than just whether or not someone is positive or not. This is about a system that is um, distressed right now because we can't keep up. We can't keep up and we can't deliver. Um, and so I think it's that two dimension. Uh, but I agree with uh, Director Graziano I don't think we've captured well enough what the impact is for students. You know, we, we've, we've talked about staff, we've talked about positivity rate, but he's absolutely right. Director Lung and I went to a student advisory group and we heard just some, some really heartbreaking stories from our kids. Some that say, I've never felt so alone in my life. We had kids that experienced a, a peer completing suicide. I mean. And so it's it's dreadful that what we're what not what we're doing, but what this is doing to our to our students. And and so that's truly the the tug of war. I think we all feel is is we can sit here and say, yeah, this makes sense, obviously, because we've got staff that need a something desperately different right now because they just can't sustain the current condition. Um, but at the same time, Director Graziano is absolutely right. How do, we, how do we address the ripple effect of what this does to student learning? So um, that would be my response as well. Director Meek? Yeah, more along that line, I guess. As I'm sitting here and I'm just thinking through everything, you know, basically bottom line is based on the current COVID rates and what we are required to do to keep our schools open and safe, we really just don't have the infrastructure and resources that we need to make that happen. And, you know, I'm, I'm listening to my colleagues, you know, bring up mental health and listening to the student 
bring up mental health. Um, I attended the Douglas County Youth Initiative meeting this week and hearing from them the e-learners feeling disconnected. And so, you know, it would be really helpful to hear how are we going to really dig in to those areas and make sure that we're doing everything we can to deploy our resources that might be freed up through a remote time period, which we need to go through. But I also want to be thinking about what are the resources and infrastructure needed, you know, looking into second semester to serve those students that are most at risk and needing it. And I, I feel really strongly our, our youngest learners need to be in our schools to learn. And so what do we need to do to make that happen? So if we need to meet weekly, you know, if we like, we need to do whatever we need to do to make that come to fruition. And we need to tell our community what they need to do to make that come to fruition. We need to work with our students. They are the best equipped to tell us what they need to feel connected. And, and I know everyone is working 24 seven and our system is doing everything possible and we need to do more, right? And so those are the kinds of activities that I feel like we need to be talking about moving forward and really thinking through so that we can work with our community, we can work with our legislators, we can work with others to rally the resources and the tools to make sure we're taking care of all of our kids. And just so you know, uh, in terms of Superintendent Weiss, we're not expecting you to respond. This is the discussion yeah. part of, this is just us uh, conversing. So I know Director Hansen, Director Chancha Shore, and Director Holtzman, Director Long. So Director Hansen, go ahead. I just want to um, start off by saying that I, I hear that um, there was possibly um, w there could have been more information provided on the student impact, but I honestly feel like by talking about teacher impact, we are talking about student, Im student impact. And I just wanna be really cautious that we're not furthering this narrative within our community, that it's an us versus them or a, a community versus teacher. Um, whether you think that COVID is a, a deadly virus or um, a news hoax, or whether you think we should be hybrid or remote or in person, I think that we all agree that the employees within our district are our greatest asset. And what we are able to provide our employees is what they in turn directly provide our students. And when we are asking our teachers, for example, to teach our um, in-person learners, uh, manage a hybrid schedule. Um, our high school teachers, many of them are teaching online classes as well. And then we have a family who is in quarantine and those parents are reaching out and asking that teacher to um, just loop their, loop their kids into what they're doing. We're asking something completely impossible of our staff. And um, I just think that we can't overlook that that ties in directly with the impact on student. And so even if this was framed more from impact on staff, it is without question impact on student. Um, I, I also feel like we need to highlight the fact that our transmission rates inside the four walls of our school buildings is fairly low because we have had success with the stringent protocols that we're using with quarantine. Um, I, I think that if you go and listen to what the, the staff feedback has been, it's a lot of that quarantine process that is creating the nearly impossible work environment. And what that kind of the, the conclusion that you can draw from that, which is what Director Meek was sharing, is what can we do within our community to, to work together? If, if the transmission is not happening within school and the 
the protocol for quarantine is frustrating to people, then maybe we need to take a really hard look at the fact that when you have homecoming parties, when you have Halloween parties, when you have birthday parties and you you try to skip the part of um, the pandemic and just fast forward to normal, that there are consequences. And um, I just, I'm really struggling with the the cause and effect here. And um, I feel like a lot of people really, really have good points, but everybody wants us to solve a problem that takes more than seven people to solve. And we are dumping this, this horrific problem on our employees. The people who work with our children every single day deserve better. And I think that um, if our community is not willing to have some hard conversations about what we're willing to sacrifice to keep our kids in school, we don't have much of a choice to move to remote. And based on the numbers that I have seen to date, I don't know that I'm comfortable even waiting until after Thanksgiving. All right. Thank you, Director Hansen. Director Chanchashore and the Director Holtzman. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I have to say, I, I live in this profession, and I, I'm a lifelong educator. And if you don't know me, and you don't know that that's where my blood runs, um, then let me tell you now, this is where I live. And this is the most blessed profession in the whole entire world. We are the luckiest people ever to have committed our lives to education because it is if if that's not how you feel i'm not sure you're an educator and i do think educators feel that way i also believe that we are accountable to our profession we are accountable to our community and we are accountable to our children so as much as i understand um, i have immense curiosity for how can schools meet the needs of our community during this time. Um, I have incredible empathy for teachers. I am a teacher. I was a teacher. My daughter is a teacher. I work with teachers every day. I have incredible empathy for teachers and I know we as educators have never had to look at education this way. I also know that we can do this and that we can do this better than moving in and out and in and out and in and out, but we have to be able to believe that that's what we can do. I am humbled by what our parents and our teachers go through on a daily basis. I am no longer in that role where I am trying to raise children, have a job, and balance what it's like, but I have seven grandchildren who are going to school and I'm watching two of my daughters balance that on a daily basis. And do they feel successful? Absolutely not. Do the teachers that I work with on a daily basis feel successful? I don't think we feel all that successful every single day. We have to be able to look at education through a different lens than we are currently looking. So I have to say that I'm understanding and I'm empathetic. I mean, there, there, there is no way I believe that teachers, I know the work. So I know that, that our paid staff is working pretty, very, very hard, harder than they may have ever worked before and representing that in how, in how we're serving our kids at this point. I also know that our teachers are represented. We hear from our, the union president who is paid by the teachers and who is representing the teachers every meeting to say to us, we need teachers to be represented. If teachers are not feeling represented in this county at this point in time, or in this country at this point in time, um, I am urging you to continue to have a voice as often as you possibly can. And also, I encourage us, educators, Corey, and everybody else, and everybody that I'm working with now to look at school in a new lens to say, yeah, you know what, we have COVID. And COVID is the problem. 
David Ray always says, let's honor the, don't keep honoring the problem. And that has said to me, we cannot keep honoring COVID as the problem. What we need to do is move on from this problem. And maybe this is the answer for now, but I can't accept this as the answer forever or until COVID goes away or until we have a, a, a some, kind of, some kind of magic thing happen in the world. <laughs> we have this reality. So educators, I'm saying we have to fix this somehow. We have to do school somehow differently. So we have to look at it through a different lens. And I am also saying we cannot change belief statements of people. That is also not our job. It is not, and I will not take that on. I cannot change the belief system of my neighbor. And I don't even want to. That's not my job. People need to believe what they believe. And we have to respond to data as public educators. So if people are having parties and if people are getting together and bringing COVID into the schools, what is our job? Our job is to figure out, so how do we have school? So I am encouraging us to think about what's a new way for us to serve our kids. And it doesn't look like rolling in and rolling out. And it doesn't look like going remote for everybody all the time. Or it doesn't mean we have three weeks here and two weeks there. What does it mean? How do we serve our community in a different, new way beyond thinking about the problem and honoring the problem? Thank you, Director Todd Shore. And I'm just gonna remind directors, we really wanna make sure we're responding to the recommendation. Um, Mr. Weiss has pl placed a recommendation up for us in terms of his process based on the work he's done with his cabinet, with principals, with teachers, his understanding of the pulse of our system. And so I would ask us to come back to that to make sure that we're giving him that feedback. Director Holtzman, go ahead. Okay. Um, so I'm just gonna, I, I just, first of all, I want to, I want to, thank our staff, all of our staff and our students who come into our schools every day and, and do what we've asked in terms of the mitigation strategies. You know, they are washing their hands and staying as far away as they can and they're wearing their face coverings and, and the data that you've shown us tonight shows that it's making a difference. That um, I think that we can ascertain from from what we've seen that most of the spread is not happening within our schools. It's coming from outside. Um, and, I, and I think you did a good job of showing that. And I just wanted to thank the people within our schools that are, are helping make that happen. Um, I think based on everything you've said, it's clear to me that you know, our, our educators, our staff are the important, most important resource that we provide our students. Um, and this is impacting those human resources in a great way. It's impacting our students because of that. And if we continue in this same, in this, along the same path, that doesn't seem sustainable. It does seem to be at a tipping point from what you've told us tonight and from what I've heard from um, our community within our schools. Um, you know, I, I support this recommendation as heartbreaking as it is because I know that it breaks all of our hearts because we all know that the best way to educate students is to be in person with, with their educators, with their teachers, and, and with the schools that care about them. So I know that none of us wanna move in this direction, but I think that you have shown us that um, based on the current data and the current just feasibility of continuing at this pace and, and in the way we're going, um, that this recommendation is is somewhat inevitable according to at least the current data. And um, it will become more so most likely when um, the state looks at it and says, in fact, you're in orange, not yellow. And when we're in orange, then we don't get to do the targeted contact tracing. And, um, and then in fact, the state doesn't recommend that we be in person as much. They would not recommend that. So, um, so I support this recommendation. I, I would just end um, by saying that we do need continued community help. And, um, and I think our community is trying. And, and I think I'd like to point out too that each of us as board members and each of us as cabinet members and interim superintendent, all of our, we're all a part of this community, you know, as small business owners, as you know, the spouse of a healthcare worker. Um, 
We all think of this from a lot of different lenses, but when I say we need support from our community, I'm talking about myself. I'm talking about I need to be especially cautious um, not to do a lot of social gatherings, um, not to do any outside of my home, you know, to follow, follow what the experts are telling us and it will help all of us. It will help us be able to get back um, to more in-person learning and, um, and I would ask that our fellow leaders in the community, whose job it is to, um, to you know, our, our, our task is to be trustees of the school district, but there are other people who are elected to be trustees of other parts of our community. And I would ask for their help and their continued help in setting an example for the community and helping us out in that way. So, so thank you for your work. Thank you for the presentation. And like I said, as heartbreaking as it is, I. I think that um, you know I have no choice but to support this. And I guess I would end with one final question. Um, as we target that January 4th teacher work day and the January 5th return for students, you know, I know that you said you'd look at the data again December 28th. And I'm assuming and just would like confirmation that you know, we'll be looking at a, a seven to 14 day, and I believe our dashboard actually says 14 day, you know, positive trend in our numbers, some significant change. Um, before we would we would do that on January 4th and 5th. So that's my question and thank you. Yeah, great question. Um, I don't think it's responsible for us to predict out what January will hold. I don't wanna say we should push out two weeks because we're coming back from another break. We need a plan to be back. We need to look at the data on the 28th, be prepared for all of it, communicate with our, our, our staff and our community um, so we're all ready, prepared, there's not surprises. Um, but we are planning to be back on the 4th and 5th, and uh, we'll continue to build that now to that time and uh, evaluate, communicate. But again, we're not planning to be back remote. That could be the case, just like in any of these situations, you have to look at the fluid model of remote mm -hmm. to hybrid to full in person. Um, but we're going to plan accordingly uh, to be back and continue to communicate so there's not surprises. All right, thanks. All right. Director Long, I just want to follow up with, with Director Long's <coughs> question real quick in terms of plan time for our teachers. And I, that was one of our topics. I know Mr. Weiss was really, how are we taking care of teachers and providing them the time? Is, in your plan, is there is there a plan forward? If So the way I'm reading that is that if you move forward with this by next Monday, you're going to communicate to the community that we're doing this. Do we have in this a plan for our teachers, especially our elementary teachers, um, who are going to full remote. Um, do we have a plan for them to be able to have a day to, do, to prepare for that? Yeah, we worked with principals a little bit today and started talking about it. We are looking at the Friday of next week, which would be the 20th, is that right? Okay, so top of my head, so good memory, I got lucky. Uh, we're looking at the 20th for sure as a, as a work day to plan going into that break. If and when we make this decision and put it out there, we'll be making sure we communicate that with everybody and we have planning. Uh, we do have regional meetings uh, on Thursday with principals, so we're working at continuing to evaluate, look at everything, look at pressure points, plan accordingly with all the, the, the feedback and questions that came in of where we are within that uh, work, and then also uh, to look at that time to help teachers um, also be prepared. Very good, thank you. Yes. All right. Director Long? Well, I just want to make sure that, you know, there's a false narrative that we're not taking care of our working parent or a student, if we don't go back to our five days of school or we go uh, remote learning, I think that is absolutely not correct. I want to make sure that the school district is doing their best to educate our student under a pandemic. Every single people who sit here, our 8,400 employee, their heart and soul is trying to make sure that our student is successful and the working parents, the problems that we have at the moment. It's not because we don't want, everybody knows five days of school is important and it's great for student and it's you know, less the burden of the parent, but we do not have the most important ingredient to be able to do that under the pandemics, our employee, our employees is also our community member. They are also the parents of this school district. 
They're also the taxpayer. They're also the parent, grandparent. They, they are a part of us. We somehow we forgot and separate them as a category versus you know, <laughs> the other parent. I think that's not do a justice fight for the people that work for us. They are a part of the community. We're the largest employer of this county, and many of them live here. Their students study here. They are part of us. They are your neighbors. They are your grandparents. They are your cousins. They are your friends. I just want to make sure that we see these whole things. We don't just break it down and say, oh, employee abstract. I mean, all I'm trying to say is, I, as I said a while ago, I appreciate you know, for you to taking a tough decisions because either way you do, there will be somebody who stand up and tell you you're wrong, okay? Being a tough leader is to make sure that you stand up and based on the scientific data that you get, the survey of the employee that you have and take the temperature of the community to make the best decisions for our students. And, and judging from the factor that you give to me today, I think you did that. I, I'm satisfied with you know, what you tell me. There are a couple of things I want you to consider. One, when you make decisions that after fall break, we're going to all remote, please give um, our community at least a week of notice or, or you know, so they know they can plan you know, for what they are doing. And second, mental health, e-learners, how can we work with our community together to find a solutions to give them more activity for the e-learner. And this is, this is not something that we could solve it you know, today or tomorrow. But I, I hope that we can give a plan and see that you know, we're moving towards that. I think a lot of people will understand. Um, so those are two things that I'm asking you to please you know, consider to do that. Give app, you know, enough notice when you try to do the remote and also Found the real plan to slowly, you know, improve the mental health, and then the remote, you know, uh, feelings of our e-learner student. Thank you very much for, for your work. Thanks, Director Lung. And Director Lung, you do see it was part of the pro the proposal is a five-day communication, an amp up, uh, uh, an advance notice to our parents. So I, I just want. I think we probably that's what I'm saying. I say one week. Right. I think I've, I think five days probably. I was so my suggestion is at least one week. Gotcha. All right. Uh, Director Hansen, you have a question, and then we need to move on and uh, come to some consensus about where we are with the superintendent's recommendation. Uh, Director Hansen, question? Yes. I Well, actually, I think after we come to consensus, I could probably um, ask, but I just wanted to weigh in that while we're considering planning time for teachers, I think one of the most critical questions to provide an answer to as quickly as possible is whether teachers will be able to elect to have access to their classrooms and teach during remote learning, um, during the remote learning structure from their classrooms. I think that the entire um, process of packing up and moving out and setting up a second classroom in your home um, changes that workload significantly. And if we can just let them know as quickly as possible, um, and I would like to advocate that they have full access to the buildings, I think that that could significantly change the, um, the amount of planning time that our teachers need. Yeah, so that's, that's gonna be a real easy answer. We've already decided that to be yes, um, different than the spring uh, for this time that teachers can choose to work from school. Uh, there will be times where we look at interventions, other types of opportunities that we talked about that could also look at uh, priority groups with students um, and also continue to look at other ideas within that. But yes, teachers will be able to do that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hanson. So, so board directors, I'm going to ask for your preference. We can either take this to a vote and actually vote to approve the recommendations that Mr. Weiss has presented for us. We can either, or we can come to consensus. Um, and just say that we do agree that moving forward, the way Mr. Weiss has mapped out for us is supported by this board. So 
I'm, I'm open. You can either make a motion or um, if I don't hear a motion, we will just go to looking for consensus in terms of agreement. So I'm going to ask the first question I'm going to ask is, is there anyone that would disagree with Mr. Weiss's recommendation in terms of how he sees moving forward um, with the possibility of communicating to our community a week before if remote is inevitable after Thanksgiving? Anyone be opposed to that. All right, I see no one opposed. And so I believe I'm going to say that we are at consensus, Mr. Wise, that we um, certainly support how you've mapped it out. We support the way you have captured the pulse of our system. And we believe that you certainly have uh, the best interest of our kids and our staff in mind. And I think you heard a lot of things that we would like to be considered as you're moving forward and processing and continuing to have dialogue with employees and staff. Um, I think you've heard from the board there's some things that we would like to hear more about. But I think at this point, unless there is um, a decision or a recommendation to go differently, I think we'll leave it at that, okay. that we are at a consensus of supporting your recommendation. Okay. All right. Thank you. Very good. So, board, we're going to move on to. Sorry, Mr. Weiss, that we probably are going to continue to have you um, yeah. presenting. <laughs> Our next item is to look at second semester um, in terms of things that we need to be aware of. And again, this is just setting the plate, setting the stage. I know we have uh, Chief Financial Officer Kate Kataska, who is also going to provide us some insights as well. But this is, again, board to get us ready for what we're faced with in terms of finances for second semester. So, Ms. Kataska, are you leading off? Yes, I am. All righty. Um, so last time we were here, we sort of laid out a timeline of different um, decision points and touch points along the timeline of moving into second semester. So what we've prepared for tonight is to first look at uh, the costs associated with a couple of the different sort of structure options for second semester where we could either take um, structures currently as they exist today where elementary and middle schools are operating as an independent e-learning model and the high schools continue to own their own, or shifting either elementary and or middle school uh, into that high school posture where they've really integrated that more into their school buildings. So while this isn't the only piece of that decision, if there were to be significant cost savings with that, we wanted to know that. Our goals, first and foremost, that were that we were creating as minimal disruption as possible, creating the best um, opportunities for students as possible, but cost certainly does have to at least be part of that conversation. So when we looked at that, the top two rows, um, elementary schools in blue and middle schools in green, that top section is what it would cost to roll forward under the current structure, where we've got that independent um, learning model. So really that is just a carry forward or roll forward of the salaries um, that are in place. We, we are focusing here on the staffing model, not necessarily some of the other um, things that come into play, really just trying to compare those two options because really that is a staffing decision uh, that we're, when we're looking at changing into either of those two models. So about um, $8 million in terms of the, the cost just carrying forward into the second um, semester. So then the bottom section looks at if we were to shift either elementary or middle uh, into the high school uh, support structure, what would be that estimated cost? And what we find is that really the only areas of opportunity for savings are related to either the backfills or um, those that are supporting e-learning only. Because what we know is that the SBB transfer are teachers that were already staffed within school budgets that have just shifted over into support for e-learning. So if we bring those teachers back into the fold of their elementary or middle school model, those SBBs don't change. Those staffs are still, staff are still um, sort of on the books, so to speak. And really the only places of, of savings that we have are related to folks that we've hired since the beginning of the year and who are a large part on an, a 1231 contract end date. The other slight area of saving is, is related to the e-learning support. So this is the administrative support for um, the e-learning school or feeder. 
Uh, and then the other thing that comes into play, which is not present in the first semester models, is that supplemental pay for teachers and staff who are supporting both students within a hybrid model and the 100% e-learning. So if you remember with our high schools, we gave out an allocation of $1.5 million out of CARES uh, and paid staff in a couple of different ways to, to compensate for kind of doing that double duty of, of teaching under both uh, models or structures. So that's that line that is um, towards the bottom of each of those sections, either the 2.2 million on the elementary side or about a million dollars um, on the middle school side. It assumes that we give the same $808.43 per e-learning student to um, our, our schools and then they would um, pay those, those payments in either of those three buckets. The one thing that we are also assuming here, which we will talk about in, in just another slide, is that um, the number of students under hybrid or e-learning stays the same. So we wanted to make sure that we were doing a full apples to apples and not accounting for costs that we would realize as savings because the model or that the number of students has shifted, really just trying to look at the cost of the model itself. So also important to note, um, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a couple of future slides as well. Um, this is personnel only. I mentioned that as well. Um, there are some additional costs associated with non-personnel items, specifically around technology, that would probably be ne needed if we were to bring um, e-learning into the fold in either their elementary or middle schools, just sound ampl amplifying equipment and things of that nature. And you'll see that full um, cost estimate in a couple of slides as we talk about the, the sort of full brunt of second semester. So all in all, we found it to be actually slightly more expensive in moving into those, those couple of different models. So hopping to the next slide. Corey will talk a little bit on, on this one as well. But as I said, um, while the financial, financial component of this has to be part of that decision-making process, the goal is first and foremost that we were really minimizing the amount of disruption, disruption the amount of teacher uh, changes that students were realizing. Um, and if there had been found to be a significant cost savings, it probably would have shifted this conversation a little bit, but that was not first and foremost um, in terms of the primary component of that decision-making process. Corey, do you wanna to speak to that um, anymore? Yeah, so in a nutshell, we put out a communication, so a lot of this is probably already known, but we decided to stay in the current model. Um, it's a purpose to, we have consistency, we can build off of what we're already doing. Uh, with cost savings being minimal or even the possibility of being a little more, it would only make sense to continue to do what we're doing. With that being said, there has been a shift with students and families being able to choose where they would like to be. Um, we do see about a two to one change from e-learning into schools. Now that being said, it's majority at the elementary level. So when you break it down to, to where is this happening, it's majority at the elementary level. That will change staffing and it could change teachers. Uh, we did communicate that out. We know that's tough. We're trying to work through. And, and I want you to know, anytime we look at this, we're, we're always thinking about how we take care of kids. Um, if there's ever a teacher changes, like in a regular classroom, we want to do a meet and greet. Uh, we want to put the best teachers in front of kids and build that same love for now a new person if that does change. So we're looking at those practices also. Uh, we're also looking at, uh, with those changes, we need to take care of people. So our... Uh, Principals, EDOS, HR, and e-learning admin are working with teachers and staffing to help them be in the spots where they want to be and need to be uh, and minimize changes as much as possible. So I want you to know that's a current work when you look at our timeline coming up in a few slides. Uh, that's within our same time frame we said before and those staffing and changes and adjustments are, are taking place as we speak and will continue. Mr. Wise, just a quick question. Did we run a scenario where we didn't, we held everything harmless, we didn't make any changes. I mean, I understand that the shifts of students, it makes logical sense to have teachers follow the students, but did, did we do any run as far as if we just strictly stayed status quo? Yeah, so, so even during the course of the year, we had 300 students shift out of e-learning. Then with the change of two to one, especially at the elementary level, you have some classes that are very, very small, and then you also have the need of wanting to go ADA into e-learning of teachers, then also some that want to go back to their schools. So right. even you run a model of being the same, there's gonna be shift. Uh, is that, am I answering that correctly? Or? 
Yeah, and I think even if we were to look at the previous slide again, since in those assumptions, we assumed that all students remained the same in terms of where they, they were selecting as their choice of e-learning or hybrid, that would really, on the top two sections, would really be your full brunt if absolutely nothing changed. We kept all staffing the same. We extended the 1231 contracts into the second portion of the year and kept all of that equal. I think I'm understanding, but go, go ahead. I, just, I, just, I, guess, I guess what worries me is when I see that statement, some teachers are, some of our students are gonna have different teachers. And I wanna understand, have, did we look at any other solution to say, no, we understand you only have nine kids in that e-learning class, but we're gonna keep the teacher there. I mean, yeah, so we looked at all of those scenarios. We also looked in trying to say as, as students, what do students want, and then also what do teachers want? There are some teachers that were in a model that we're asked to go to that model, and some would like to come back. So I think even in the adjustment where you try to help staffing um, reflect upon where they would like to be, and also shifts that we now have some teachers that would like to the ADA model. Uh, current state with the fears and COVID up, uh, we have had the request of more teachers to move to e-learning. So that shift of, of how you make that happen um, as you build any type of schedule will take place. Gotcha. And, and, I, and I just, in all reality, you try to minimize changes, but there's some want of change and then some need of change. Thank you. All righty, so then hopping um, a couple slides forward there. So we talked a little bit about the, the results of Express Check-In. Um, really, it's about a two to one for students that are shifting uh, into back into the hybrid model versus exiting out to the e-learning model. Um, and then if we look at the next slide, which is our timeline. So this is just a, a refresh of what we, we spoke to last time. Um, so we're here, here today on the 10th talking about that, that confirmation of that second semester structure. We will move forward uh, in, the, in the model similar that we did for first semester um, and continue to look for if there are areas of, of cost savings that we can you know, experience within, within those two, um, sort of keeping it the same. So as we come back in December for our December meetings, we'll have a couple more bits of information that will be known. We'll have final October count numbers, which is a big part of this, and we'll talk a little bit, sort of a preview of, of what that's looking like soon. Um, and we'll have those staffing decisions for the large part finalized related to our elementary, middle, and our high school um, e-learners for, for that matter. So moving on to sort of the broader kind of state of the state, um, the September economic forecast was, was much more positive than was our June forecast. The largest part of that is related to higher than anticipated tax collections. Um, if you all remember that, that when things started to shut down, they extended the tax filing deadline to July rather than April. And so as that happened, the state anticipated that they would experience much lower um, actual tax collections once that deadline came to pass. Um, in reality, they collected about almost 900 million higher than was projected in June related to those July filings. So all in all, that is a very, very good sign. Um, on next, on uh, November 2nd, the governor's budget was released. It's important to note that this is the first step in a very long process. Um, the, the governor's budget tends to be a little bit more optimistic than what is ultimately legislated and finalized. Um, this one happened to be maybe even a bit rosier than any of us were, were really anticipating. So it's pretty aggressive, assuming about 800 million um, in additional funds to K-12 education, an estimated um, increase of about $904 per pupil on average through the School Finance Act formula. It's important to note that um, of that $904, that is the average in Douglas County, just based on our, our demographics and our, our makeup of students and, and the district itself, tends to fall lower than that average. So um, as Colleen and team have done some number runs, we are actually anticipating if that were to hold true at 100% reality, um, that would be about $874 per pupil for specifically Douglas County. Again, if that were to come to fruition, um, after the pass through to charters, we would have about $41 million of additional funds within the School Finance Act formula. Very, very rosy picture though. So um, while it is incredibly good news that this is positive, it is incredibly good news that we're even talking about adding funds, period. We should absolutely anticipate that those numbers will come down um, as it moves through the process and as we get, uh, especially our December forecast, 
and see what um, potentially the resurgence of COVID does to the economy um, and other, other factors that are certainly gonna be in play um, as, we, as we continue this long stretch um, through the end of the, an end of the legislative season. So a couple of other um, important measures on the ballot. Um, Amendment B repeals Gallagher, which is a provision within um, uh, the Constitution that sets a ratio of residential and non-residential assessment rates. Through the repeal of Gallagher, it'll actually um, hold those rates flat. So while this isn't an immediate increase in revenue to K-12, by holding those assessment rate flats, it makes it more predictable and it pre preserves the local share of funding that we, um, we generate through the School Finance Act formula. So in theory then, the state's capacity should increase because we're able to, to make the local share more predictable. Um, Prop 116 is a state income tax reduction. Certainly we'll see that in future years um, impacting K-12 finance um, on the negative side as the state is collecting less revenue in terms of their state share. So this could uh, result in an increase to the budget stabilization factor in future years. Prop 118 is paid family and medical leave. Um, I'm calling this one neutral at this point. Um, within at least my initial read, um, there is an opt-out clause for local governments. There is a lot of debate among the um, regional CFOs and Denver Park, or Pikes Peak partners as to whether school districts fall into that category of a local government. There are times when we do, and there are times when we don't. So the opt-out, if, if we are classified as a local government, which I, I do believe that we will be, um, we would have the opt-out into that program and we would not have to make a contribution to the statewide family medical leave um, program based on our amount of payroll. And then the last one is Prop EE, uh, taxes on nicotine products. Definitely a good thing for, for education. Um, uh, these taxes will be passed on nicotine products and largely fund um, preschool in the out years. So hopefully we'll, we'll be looking at some fully funded preschool programs uh, in the future. All right, so I do wanna just pause and see if there's any questions on kind of ballot stuff before we move into um, a preview of second semester kind of in, in totality. Directors, any questions? Uh, Director Meek? Are you hearing any talk about mid-year rescission? Um, that seems to be lessening. So as we know that statewide enrollment is down, and we are pretty consistently down about 3% across the board, um, and we've talked a little bit about this in, in past meetings, if enrollment is down and at a minimum the pie can stay the same, we should be able to um, uh, forego the need for, for a rescission. So that is becoming much, much, much quieter in terms of, of the rumbling. So I am really quite hopeful, especially with um, the positive September forecast and with a very optimistic governor's budget request that that, that should alleviate the need for a rescission or at least should signal um, a lower need for that rescission. Dr. Meek, follow up. So just to recap, when we went through our budget process uh, last spring, um, we needed to cut about $31 million because of that state shortfall. Mm -hmm. And we made that cut, and we were very worried about a potential mid-year rescission, and we wanted to be very cautious. So what we're seeing right now is we're in a pretty good place. We don't know exactly how that will land, but as we are looking at what are the resources and infrastructure that we need to have in place mm -hmm. to be serving our students moving forward, um, I'd, I just wanna point out we're in a pretty good position right now from what I'm seeing. And we'll give you, um, so as we step through these next couple of slides, give you sort of the, the preview on um, some of the short and long-term things that are on the horizon, but, but you're correct. Things are looking more optimistic than we thought. And I will say, I think I've said many times, commend Ms. Doan uh, for, for passing a balanced budget because that is gonna give us a whole lot more grace in the decisions that we'll be making heading into second semester. Um, so again, again, kudos as, as I know those were tough conversations um, just before I, before I started with you all. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> all right. Go ahead, carry on, Ms. Kataska. Director Meek, did you Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, did, did I miss Director Long? I gotta move my chair, Director Long. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you know, that size better than me. <laughs> That's right, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. Um, I just wanted to know, um, 
do we take into considerations that next semester we may have more students coming back, um, knowing that the vaccines may be in sight? Well, just the fact that after the October count day, we, we have <laughs> a couple hundred students that show up and we are not yep. uh, having additional fun for, and now with the vaccine is inside, and um, if we have a, so would that affecting our financial you know, situations um, if we get more students back? Because what, we lost 2,000 students? Yep, and we'll talk about that a little bit in, in one of the next slides here as well. Very good, all right, carry on. All righty, so um, what this slide looks at, again, you, you saw the sort of left half of this table in our last board meeting when we looked at the, t the cost in totality for first semester, at least estimates there. Um, so about $13.3 million supporting um, really both that e-learning and hybrid model because some of this is related to um, backfills that are within school buildings, um, but much of this is, is really truly that, that e-learning cost. So then layering on top of that, if we collapse those two columns that were on the previous slide related to the second semester cost for um, elementary and middle schools, along with what we know to be true on the high school side um, and some of the non-personnel um, estimates, we're looking at about $12.6 million uh, in terms of an estimated cost for, for second semester. So the footnote to the bottom there um, notes that we've, we would look at about $7.2 million in cost that would be additional heading into second semester. Not additional first over second semester, but because that CARES Act funding um, has expired, that's what will be, that's what primarily funded all of our first semester um, additional costs. So this would become a general fund impact. Now, the reason that the bottom line total there in green is at about 12.6, and I'm saying we would actually have about 7.2 million that we, we would be looking um, to fund is because most of that is in the 5.3, 5.4 related to the SBB transfer. And remember that those are positions that are already funded within our SBBs, and we assume that they would continue to be funded within their SBBs, so we wouldn't have to fund them again or, or double fund that. So that's why that 7.2 million is less than the 12.6, which is the bottom line total. Clear as mud? Good. <laughs> you go. All right. Um, so to Director Lung's questions around October count. So uh, we've got about 2,000 kiddos that we um, have lost in, uh, pr projections versus enrollment for October count. Shortly after that October count window closed, we saw about 400 students come back. Um, we are working, the, the student data team is actually working to finalize what is the funded pupil count. And it is possible that we will get counted for some of those 400 kids that came back after October count. But there are a couple few handfuls of kiddos that are still um, in high debate, which means uh, we've got multiple districts that are actually trying to claim them as enrolled. And so that's why those numbers aren't yet finalized. So once we have those numbers from student data, we'll do a full update um, and have those, those final tallies. But to the right-hand side there is the estimates. If we looked purely based on the October 2nd um, enrollment, we would be adjusting SBBs and then our charter formula by about $10.8 million. And that is just a standard run of adjusting for um, those enrollments as we've, we've done each and every year. The total program or our total revenue reduction is actually about $10.1 million. Um, assuming those averaging provisions um, within, within the School Finance Act formula. So if we net that out, we've got um, uh, an additional um, 1.1 million that we would hold harmless within our SBBs. So not included in that 10.8. Um, we actually already have provisions within our own school funding model that say either your first two or your four, first four kids are basically freebies. Uh, depending on your school size. So if you're above 600 kiddos, we give you two for free. And if you're above, below 600 kiddos, we give you four for free. So that's that hold harmless line. And then the charter reduction. So all in all, that's a gap of about $440,000, which all in all, uh, for a $10 million revenue reduction, feeling okay about that. Um, it's once we get over to the right-hand side, that we do have a number of schools, about 17, 
that after we look at their, true, uh, their October true up, after we take into account what carryover that they have available, after we take into account the hold harmless that's already existing um, within plans, um, and after we take into account what we call enrollment reserves, which are dollars that a school might set aside thinking that their enrollment is going to, to, to decline, we still have about 17 schools that are still going to be in a, a pretty big deficit. So about 1.5, $1.6 million um, of concern uh, of, of schools that I think we're gonna need to, to, to support um, in some additional hold harmless dollars. So we've got our uh, budget analysts are already working very closely with school leaders to make sure that one, we understand all of those buckets of money that they reserved or set aside, uh, and two, just see if there are um, plans that they already have in place, positions that maybe they didn't hire for, kind of knowing the writing was on the wall, um, and, and that will be part of the full budget update that we'll have um, in December as well. So now jumping ahead um, to that conversation about reserves. So um, in the sort of middle column um, is the adopted budget. And as you can see, we've got total um, no use of, of ending fund balance. So kudos again. Uh, but if we roll forward into what we're forecasting based on um, first quarter, which is not a lot of data, all in all, um, we do know that we're going to have an increase in what we projected our fund balance to be at the time the budget was adopted of about $10 million. Most of that is related to um, a school counselor and security grant that we anticipated would have been fully spent in 1920. So while that fund balance is going up, the expenses are gonna go up right along with it. So that's really that use of fund balance there. But to your, your comment, Director Meek, we're in a, a pretty good position here. So if I look over to the right-hand side, though, these are some um, short and long-term sort of uh, impacts that are definitely on our radar. So the first being the 7.2, $7.3 million that we're estimating as that um, second, second semester cost now that we don't have um, the CARES funding available to us. Uh, we do have about a $1.2 million estimated increase to our utilities costs related to system flushing. So as we're bringing in either pretty cold air or much warmer air and then having to either heat it back up or cool it back down, um, that, that is, uh, we are already noticing some increase in those utilities costs. The next one is that earmarking of some money for the hold harmless for our schools um, that are still in a deficit on their October count even after all of those factors, that's about 1.6 million. And then moving into the long term. So um, as we think to, to next year and beyond, um, if, if there is um, additional money from the state, if that forecast to, it holds up as, as optimistic as we hope it will, um, if there is no rescission, if there is additional state aid um, or federal aid, um, you know, starting to look at how much would it cost to bring back or reinstate the furlough days, to bring those back into people's paychecks, um, potential future compensation adjustments. Um, uh, covering increased para rates, um, potential uh, benefit rate increases, um, and then potential future year revenue loss kind of just always going to always going to be out there because that's the the nature of the beast. But um, so while yes, uh, things are are looking much more optimistic. One of the things that we'll do in our next meeting is we talk kind of about that full sources and uses of money, um, and really what we're we're looking at with some of those things becoming a little bit more clear in terms of October count, the December forecast should be in by the second December meeting uh, and things like that. So um, again, that's, that's all I've got. Um, open it up to questions here. Director's questions. Sorry, director's questions. And so uh, Ms. Kataska, so then in December, we're gonna really talk about the contingencies in a more in-depth manner to say, do we want to reduce yep. and do we want to use our contingencies to cover whatever the 10.1 million or whatever it is that we're uh, needing to, to cover? We begin that conversation in December. Yep, and so that sort of sets the table for January when we formally amend our budget and would actually be having to pass resolutions that would um, potentially utilize some of those reserves. Um, the other piece that we'll have a, a firmer update for you all on uh, in December is that estimate of um, remaining CARES funding that we've been talking about putting towards uh, increased learning time. 
which is absolutely going to help uh, on that second semester cost. We're estimating right now, still holding at about six, $6 million that we can um, transfer over to the general fund. So that will certainly alleviate uh, pressure on those reserves. Very good. So directors, any other questions? Ms. Kataska is setting the stage for us for our next meeting in December. Any other questions? Director Holtzman? So I apologize. This question is partially about the last part of your presentation and partially we didn't really take a break when we were talking about um, slide, I think it's 26, second semester staffing options and costs. So I just want to make sure I'm understanding this. So the second semester staffing and costs, those on slide 26 only are elementary and middle school, correct? Um, but then in your later slide, um, almost at the end, I think it's slide number 33, um, it looks like that does include high school supplemental pay. So that, that 7.2 million for second semester is all included in slide 33 for all elementary, middle, high. And so I guess my question is when you look back at the, the beginning information about second semester and we only talked about elementary and middle, have we continued to talk with, and this may be for more than just you, other ways that we can support um, our high schools in their e-learning efforts? Um, is there a need for additional staff? In other words, have we had any of our current e-learning high school teachers say, I can't keep doing this. I can't keep doing these three jobs. Um, so we need to set aside money for that. Or have we come up with anything technology-wise that might be helpful to them? Um, you know, I, I have a couple of ideas just from a school visit I was at, but I know that the experts have been talking you know, all of you in cabinet, interim superintendent wise and our principals and just wondered if you all had come up with anything and we need to plan for that in our budget also for high school e-learning second semester. So I'll let um, Corey speak to most of that, but part of those conversations, it was, it was during the level meeting. So we said to all of our elementary, middle and high school, what's working, what's not about first semester. You know, it, all things, you know, if we had all the money in the world, would you want to keep doing this the same way in terms of structure and, and it being integrated into the school platform? Or would you like to change something? Um, and so while, you know, again, Corey will speak to kind of the high school response there, it was absolutely part of the conversation. Um, the decision, though, came down to, you know, let's sort of more formally look at elementary and middles, given that they would be more of a shift in, in the overall model. You know, as high schools went through the first time, they know we can provide almost the exact same amount. We've also said if we need to shift and add more, uh, come to us and talk to us. Even in their amounts, they might choose to do it a little bit differently. And they're working with their teachers and obviously their, their needs of classes, um, which to look at that. The good part is we have a little more prep time. Uh, the schools took on e-learning very quickly and had to put it in place and we owe them a uh, a big thank you for the amount of work they put in. And now they're trying to plan better for that. So they're working with similar spreadsheets to call out um, which classes is an overage, how to do it with our staff. Uh, so they're working with their teachers also. Yeah, that's great, thank you. All right, directors, any other questions? All right, Ms. Kataska, thank you once again. And we'll look forward to December to see kind of what we do next. Directors, I'm feeling like we just keep charging ahead unless you're feeling fatigued and need a break, but are you okay with taking care? I know we've had Mr. Bingham and our uh, uh, long range planning people waiting to talk to us about this director district re, uh, I can't even say it, reapportionment is the word. So Mr. Cosgrove, uh, if you wanna do introductions for us, Mr. Cosgrove, Chief Operating Officer, and we'll this again is an information only at this point. We will have an opportunity to make a final decision at our next meeting. Mr. Cosgrove. Good evening, directors. Every four years, school districts having director districts must determine the population in each of the director districts. And if each is not substantially the same, the school board has a duty to revise the districts to comply with the specifications in accordance with state law. The last reapportionment of director districts was accomplished in 2016. 
Accordingly, the district's consultant, Western Demographics, has evaluated director district populations and determined reapportionment is necessary. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Mr. Shannon Bingham with Western Demographics, who will give a presentation on the current populations and scenarios. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cosgrove. Mr. Bingham, are you there? One more call from Mr. Bingham. Is Mr. Bingham, do we have him on as a panelist, Mr. Blair? Yes, we do. Okay. We're getting him shifted over right now. All right, very good. Thank you, sir. Excellent. Can you hear me now? Yes, Mr. Bingham, we can hear you. Welcome. Good evening. Very good. Thanks. It's a, it's a privilege to be uh, with you this evening. I'll be very quick. Um, as Mr. Cosgrove uh, mentioned every four years, the um, Roughly 80 school districts in the state of Colorado that use the director district form of apportionment are required to reapportion. And I have a um, PowerPoint that identifies the extent to which um, we are um, out of compliance. Um, I've probably done 150 of these over the last 35 years. And so um, I have done ours several times uh, already. I cannot make that larger, so I'm, I'm going to have to uh, ask someone else to advance the slides for me if they if I can. Excellent. So um, basically, I have tables and maps that show uh, uh, what the analysis was. We are growing about 8,000 people um, per year in the district. The uh, director district reapportionment is based on total population, regardless of age. It's not people over 18 or registered electors, it's just total population. Uh, the next slide talks about um, our uh, uh, growth uh, as estimated by the census uh, since 2016. And you can see that annual 8,000 person per year um, growth. Um, we have tried to configure our districts so that they receive somewhat of an equal portion of that, but um, uh, unfortunately um, uh, there are three districts that are a little bit um, out, out of whack relative to the, the average. Uh, the next slide shows uh, the, the scenarios and the description of the data uh, source, basically. Um, we try to maintain a historic pattern of representation. Uh, we're about to get a new census, a 2020 census, so a lot of what we have up until now is based upon estimates and everybody that's doing congressional reapportionments and school board and city council ward reapportionments have been using uh, estimates from the census. And so most of us, when we get up against the end of the decade, try to make minimal changes. I've been involved with the uh, federal court system as an expert witness and have um, helped establish case law in the state of Colorado that we should deviate by not more than 3% to ensure compliance. Uh, the uh, districts are supposed to be compact, contiguous, and as nearly equal in size as possible. Um, I have not uh, uh, unseated any uh, existing directors as a result of these two uh, scenarios that I'm about to show you. Uh, the next slide shows our uh, current situation. Um, the uh, actual uh, 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 population reference for our 2016 or 2017 data is different depending upon where you look in the census. But as you look at the, uh, the uh, deviations here, you can see that we have almost a 6% uh, deviation in District B. Um, which is where Sterling Ranch and Solstice is. So we've seen a lot of growth there. And in some of the other districts, we're a little bit behind the average district size of about um, 51,000 uh, people um, in each of our seven uh, districts. And so based on that, I'm recommending that we perform a, a limited uh, adjustment to the boundaries. Over here in this table, you can see the um, large scale uh, growing uh, areas that would be associated with each one of those districts. Uh, the next slide shows um, 
by proposed scenario one, the blue lines are the existing districts and the shaded area is my proposed change. So you can see that there are slight changes between A, which is predominantly Highland Ranch, um, uh, B, which is predominantly Roxborough, and, um, and it includes that Sterling Ranch and Solstice area. And then C, um, I am proposing that that become larger as well to um, absorb some of these growing areas. So scenario one is somewhat of a minimal change, but it addresses some of our growth um, in that uh, Santa Fe corridor, that northwest uh, corner of the district. And it uh, shows uh, a balanced population in the next uh, slide where you can see a table. Uh, well, this shows the shift areas. So what I'm doing here is taking the um, Solstice uh, and Sterling Ranch area, or at least the north half of Sterling Ranch, and putting it in District A. And um, I'm also adjusting uh, uh, District C by making District B a little bit smaller so that it could contain more of the south half of Sterling Ranch as that area continues to grow. And then there's a slight adjustment over um, north of Castle Rock where we take um, a part of District D and give it to District E. This next slide will show you what the population effect of that is. And I get everybody down um, around 1% or better, and everybody is balanced very close to that 51,454 uh, person average district size. Uh, scenario two is slightly different. Um, it is shown in the next map, and instead of pulling the north part of uh, Solstice and um, Sterling Ranch into District A, I pull it instead into District C. So you can see that's the primary uh, difference there, and I leave uh, District A um, a little bit more um, similar to what it is now and I perform the change into District C. Uh, the next uh, map shows the shift areas that would be in that area. And again, you can see that um, I take uh, this Solstice Sterling Ranch area and I pull that into District C instead of into District A. And then I perform a, a, another change up here on the county line to move an area from C into A in order to balance what we're doing down here in the Sterling Ranch Solstice area. Same change over from B to E, similar change from B to C to balance that as well. Uh, the real difference is just what is the destination for the north half of Sterling Ranch and the Solstice community. Does it go into A or does it go into C? Uh, the next table shows, again, a very balanced result, slightly less um, desirable as far as uh, the deviation, about 2% low in District B, but we're expecting uh, Sterling Ranch to continue to grow very rapidly and um, uh, close that gap. Uh, we also have obviously eight or ten other extremely rapidly growing subdivisions around the district. Um, and um, I can't warrant whether or not some of these other districts may become out of whack as Crystal Valley Ranch grows and some of our other subdivisions grow. But given the way that we have the district organized, we've tried to create some stability in the way these look so that they allow for growth. Um, and the next slide, I think, uh, is the recommendation that you examine and discuss these proposed scenarios and consider them uh, as a final action item in your December meeting. Uh, with that, I'd be delighted to respond to any questions that you might have. Very good. Mr. Bingham, as always, very clear and um, so grateful that you do this kind of work because it's something that I could not even begin to have the patience uh, to do. Uh, so thank you for your many years of helping districts figure this out. I'm truly really, really grateful. Uh, directors, do you have any questions regarding the two scenarios that Mr. Bingham proposed? And Mr. Bingham, I certainly heard you say you're leaning more to scenario one just because the, uh, the numbers certainly get us more equal than it would on um, scenario two. Uh, is that correct? 
Uh, that's correct. Uh, that's correct. Director's questions. Director's questions. Mr. Bing, did you look? I know sometimes you do an analysis around feeder because you know we like our feeder systems, and um, you know we like as directors to be able to align with feeders or align with service goals. Did you do analysis to see with this change? Does that take a school out of a director's um, area um, per se, or is it? Do we have some schools where it's still kind of split, where there's two directors covering one school? I don't think I uh, created any further splits. And again, with the uh, 2020 census data probably becoming available in 2022, I was trying to avoid making any sort of changes of that magnitude. But the physical buildings that were in the existing 2016 director districts remained in the 2017 director districts, uh, to the best of my knowledge. Very good. Thank you, sir. Good. And really, the really good, go ahead. Very long question. Well, since you mentioned that, <laughs> so I, I'm, I think you know some. I think sometimes you know uh, we get called, and then they're wondering what district. You know, we represent. Um, I'm just I'll take the example of my district, District E. Um, most of the uh, elementary school are in my district, but the elementary school that fit into the high school are not. They are probably just like 500 feet um, west of me. And in fact, my district only have um, one high school, which is a chapter high school. And so I'm just wondering when you factor into this scenario, um, would you would you try to see how we can balance out, um, you know, how many kind of high school, middle school, or whether we have nine feeder in a, in a, um, um, our school district, so to see how we could, to see how we, you know, make sure that the feeder itself is uh, entirely for within a director's district. I'm just I'm just curious, you know, um, would, would that ever be a factor in the periods we just retain that, um, you know, you consider? Because I believe that four years ago, you actually have three maps um, for considerations. Uh, may, may I respond to that? Please, Mr. Bing, go ahead. I'm sorry. So, so the assignment of, assignment of schools to individual board members for telephone call and community relations purposes has been fundamentally customary uh, throughout the state. Um, and there's really not a leakage through the school law on this topic to how board members respond to those types of questions. Uh, the lion's share, meaning 95% or more of the districts that have director districts, the board members remain elected at large. There are a few cases where you must, um, uh, you run in the district in which you reside, but the majority of the districts in the state are elected at large, and the director districts serve the function of distributing board members throughout a school district evenly. Now, some school boards have decided that certain school board members would receive all of the calls associated with elementary school. And another board member might be more comfortable dealing with um, high school issues. Or some board members might prefer to answer questions associated with specialized curriculums. And other board members would represent um, areas where there might be language requirements because of uh, language abilities of an individual board member. So the way that a board assigns those responsibilities has generally differed and has been fundamentally up to the school board. And if you felt like you would like to redistribute how you have those responsibilities for um, uh, patron relations uh, portion, um, I would think you could um, make some of those decisions on your own and negotiate among yourselves how you did that. Now, again, that would be something I would defer to your counsel and to your traditions on how you have always done things. I'm just giving you 
a statewide perspective. Thank you, Mr. Bingham. Thank you, Mr. Bingham. All right, board. So again, this is an information only item. Mr. Bingham will be back in December. This uh, reason for two steps is also to give our public an opportunity to understand some of these minor changes that's being proposed. So that if they want to provide public comment at our next meeting, they can. But at that time, we will be asked to, as uh, Mr. Bingham suggested, that there will be a recommendation from our interim superintendent to approve scenario number one. Um, any other questions? Um, Director Holtzman? Just a quick comment and a follow-up to Director Lung um, that we might want to take on at a different time. But when you look on our website, and it, it has the district map, each of us by our district and the schools that are in that geographic area, um, I just, I had noticed for a while that there's um, at least one school that isn't mentioned in my area. Um, and I don't think that the bridge program is assigned to any of the districts. And so um, it's just to some point we might want to take a cursory look and make sure we have all the schools on the map that are actually in writing there for us to look at. So. Great, uh, yeah, great along. Sounds like that's something you would be interested in as well as if we were to look at some of those programs that need to be assigned and come to some agreement with that. So thank you. So, all right. Board, let's move on. Thank you, Mr. Bingham, again for staying with us late at night, and we'll look forward to uh, talking with you again uh, next month. Thank you. Have a great evening. You too. You too. All right, board. So we're at uh, reports, and just some quick item calendar items for you. Tomorrow we will be doing our agenda planning for our December 1st meeting. And remember, our meetings are kind of wonky. Um, December 1 is our next meeting Tuesday, and then the following Thursday, the next week, is our next meeting, December 10. So just know that, you're, that that's a little bit off than our usual way that we cycle. But agenda planning tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Um, also, you should have already, for, um, but if you haven't, do it tonight. RSVP to Sandy Marsh regarding whether you're attending the elected official reception at Cherokee Ranch on November 19th. She needs uh, to hear from you as soon as possible. And then there's also the foundation is, I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Is it Highlands Ranch Mansion? Sorry, thank you, Director Lone. Highlands Ranch Mansion, that's right. Um, so anyway, make sure Sandy Head knows whether you're going to that or not. And then she's also needing uh, to know where, what our status is with the foundation is building the dream um, that they're doing. And it's a little bit different in terms of it being remote. So we need to make sure we give her that information so they can uh, count on um, some logistics around that. So those are the, the main items I have. Director Holtzman, any from you? I don't have anything. Thank you. All right. Directors, any other directors regarding board reports or information? Director Hansen, go ahead. Hansen, go ahead. Thank you. Um, as the board secretary, I just wanted to take this chance to share with our community that I'm doing um, my absolute best to respond to each and every email that we are receiving, but the reality is that I, I simply can't. Um, I, I just wanted to share that we, we really do all need your emails, we value your input, and um, we, we appreciate each of you who take the time to reach out. Um, if you you really are seeking to have a response and start a conversation, I do have um, just some tips or some insight into the process that I use when I'm going through all of the, the numbers. Um, if you engage in um, name calling or insults, I just assume that you are primarily looking to vent and not really hoping to engage in a conversation. And Accordingly, I am not going to respond. Um, if you just cut and paste an email and there's 20 or 30 people that send an identical email, um, I will respond to the first individual who shared that, that perspective, but um, then I'm going to let them go ahead and share it with, with you on whatever site or social media platform that that information uh, originated. Um, and then just um, to, to save you time, um, we, we honestly look at Tri-County Health data, all of us, all day, every day, and get frequent updates on it. And so um, it, it isn't necessary to send us the, the Tri-County Health data. Um, again, thank you so much for all of your feedback and your patience with me for 
Um, I know it takes a while to respond, but I really am trying to work through the board inbox, and um, we'll, we'll keep plugging away. Well, and Director Hanson, I know I can speak for all of us how grateful we are that you are have taken on that responsibility to respond on our behalf, uh, on the board's behalf, to all the many emails you've received. But I think those tips are great. I, I wonder if we might even try to capture that, Ms. Marsh, on our board page, some of the, the some of the, the statements that Ms. The Director Hanson just made. It might be good for us, one, for the public to know that we do have a secretary that her primary purpose is to respond to board communication, but I think some of the tips that you have shared, um, I think, might be worthy of placing that on our board page. So um, perhaps we can capture that some way to do that. So thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Directors, any other reports, any other things for the good of the group? Seeing none, let's have a motion to adjourn, please. Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion made by Holtzman, seconded by Director Lang. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Have a great evening. Thank you, Cabinet members. Thank you, Mr. Weiss. Thanks for